Regulus was eleven the first time he fell in love with James Potter. It was really rather inconvenient since he had already decided to hate him. Not for any of the obvious reasons, the tension between their families, the impending war, but because until Sirius went to Hogwarts, Regulus had been his best friend. They would make forts, read stories, and go for adventures in the back garden. When Regulus had a nightmare, Sirius was there. When their mother was angry, Sirius was there. When their father got sick, Sirius was there. But the summer after his first year at Hogwarts, all Sirius could talk about was James Potter. James Potter this, and James Potter that, and oh, wasn't he so fantastic. Regulus quickly grew to despise him, a feeling his mother seemed to share. It wasn't that she and Sirius had ever gotten along particularly well. Sirius had never been very good at being quiet or sitting still or keeping his clothes clean. But they didn't start hating each other until Sirius went to Hogwarts. Until James Potter came along. So when he boarded the train the following September, with his mother whispering viciously in his ear about all the things she would do to him if he was to find himself sorted into Gryffindor like his brother, Regulus already hated James Potter. More than he had ever hated anyone else in his little eleven-year-old life. Sirius had dragged him into the compartment with his friends, and Lupin had been kind to him, and Pettigrew a little jumpy, and Potter... Potter barely looked at him. A nod of the head, that was all, before him and Sirius were talking to one another a mile a minute, making jokes that Regulus didn't understand and telling stories he wasn't a part of. And the whole time, James Potter didn't look at him once, which was infuriating, because how is he supposed to communicate his intense dislike of the boy if he wouldn't even give him the time of day? Of course, this all became less of an issue after the sorting. Slytherins and Gryffindors are natural enemies. They rarely interact, except when forced, and besides, Regulus was a first year, a little kid. It had never mattered to Sirius before that he was younger, but now he had Potter. So, Regulus didn't see his brother much, or his brother's friends, and mostly he felt lost. He drifted through his classes, quiet and reserved, not wanting to draw too much attention to himself, not wanting to be noticed. That was how he had always survived at Grimmauld Place. He assumed it would work at Hogwarts too. He was wrong. A few weeks into school, Severus Snape found him kissing a boy. Or, perhaps more accurately, found a boy kissing Regulus. At eleven, Regulus didn't much fancy kissing anyone. He found the whole thing rather unbecoming, if he was being honest. But Roger Flint was older and bigger and didn't seem to care one way or the other what Regulus wanted. He tried to explain this to Snape after Flint ran off, but Snape was kind enough to inform Regulus that it didn't matter. People would think he was a freak either way. So it was in his best interest to do what Snape said, and that way no one would find out. It had not occurred to 11-year-old Regulus that Severus Snape, who barely had the strength in his lanky limbs to lift his own wand, was not going to out Roger Flint to the entire school. All he knew was that he didn't want Sirius to know. Oh, how little things change. So he did as Snape asked. My homework black, my laundry black, push that Hufflepuff down the stairs black. Regulus did all of it. Unlike Sirius, he had always been good at doing what he was told. A few months later, he watched James Potter punch Severus Snape in the face outside of the Great Hall. And, well, it was hard not to fall in love with him after that. Regulus takes these memories and puts them in a box, and then he buries it. He digs deep inside himself for the darkest, lowest corner, and he puts it there. He puts all of James there. You do not walk into Grimmauld Place with your walls down. Mistress Black is out for the afternoon, but she tells Creature to inform his young master Regulus that she will be returning for supper at six o'clock sharp. Regulus nods, standing awkwardly in the middle of his bedroom, feeling like a ghost, a stranger. Creature is making Master Regulus's favorite, roast pheasant. Regulus looks down at the elf and forces himself to smile. Thank you, Creature. 
I really appreciate it. The elf preens. Of course, master. Creature wants always to be a good elf at the noble house of black. You are. Always. He needs to get himself more under control. He knows that. He's letting it all get to him. The grey walls, the heavy smell of the air, the missing photos. He can't be full of cracks the first time he sees her. Is... is my father up? Creature nods. Yes, sir. He is very, very excited to be seeing Master Regulus, sir. The elf does his best attempt at a smile, the sight oddly endearing despite all the teeth. He will be taking his tea now, sir, in his bed. Regulus nods. Excellent. Thanks, Creature. That's all for now. Creature gives him a bow, apparating out of the room before his head is raised. Regulus closes his eyes, feeling the walls as much as he sees them. The weight of them. The pressure. There's never any air in this fucking house. He breathes in deep, trying to calm the anxious tremors running up and down his bones. He exhales. All of these feelings are useless and he needs to be done with them. There's no point in being afraid here. Better to wrap himself in a layer of apathy, of disinterest. Nothing matters. If nothing matters, then nothing hurts. his eyes, linking the dim room back into focus and feeling the beginning of a familiar numbness spread through him. Good, he thinks, flexing his fingers, releasing some of the tension from his muscles. There is no privacy in Grimmauld Place. The walls are covered in the shadowy silhouettes of the blacks of yore. They whisper and scowl and scurry about, and all of them belong to his mother. Bend to her will. He feels their eyes on him now as he walks stiffly down to the floor below, their gazes making his skin itch. Inhale, exhale, nothing matters. He pauses at his father's open door. His parents don't share a bedroom, of course. They haven't since Regulus was young, since before his father got sick. In his memories, his father is a towering figure with big warm hands and a domineering presence. He never spoke much, even back then. Always quiet. Regulus knows that he takes after his father, just as he knows that Sirius takes after their mother. He's sure they've both ached over that truth. Now his father is sitting in a chair by the window, flannel housecoat wrapped around him, dark hair shot through with white, the curls once so like Regulus's, gone limp. Inhale, exhale. Nothing matters. Papa? The older man's head snaps to the doorway, on edge, suspicious before he finds Regulus's face, and then he smiles. For a moment it almost doesn't look like he's dying. Kaji. He makes to stand but falters, his strength gone. Regulus has no doubt that Creature is the one who helped him into that chair in the first place. He crosses the room quickly so that his father won't try again, bending down so that he can wrap his arms around him. Look at you! His father keeps his hands on Regulus's shoulders, even as he straightens up. You've grown! Regulus rolls his eyes. It's been three months. But his father only grins. Ah, not up, but in Monty, your eyes are far wiser than they were this summer. Regulus feels the twinge of something in his chest, but quickly smothers it. It will not serve him to remember everything that has changed since the summer. Not here. Not now. Yeah. His father gestures at the chair across from him. Essaye-toi, essaye-toi. Parle ton père d'un bon moment. Parle-moi de ta vie. Je deviens fou quand c'est dans cette pièce. Orion spent most of his childhood growing up in the French countryside, 
So when he's tired, or drunk, or sick, it's the language that spills out of him. Regulus has always loved the way his father speaks French. The way his voice wraps around the vowels and hugs the end of each word. Slow and smooth, in a way English never can be. His mother hates it. But it's only because she's not very good at it. Expensive tutors are no substitute for the real thing. And Walburga cannot stand to be outdone in anything. Okay, okay. Regulus takes a seat. There's really not that much to say. I study. I play Quidditch. That's it. He shrugs. His father leans slightly forward in his <laughs> chair. More than play. You think you could pull off a monster faint and Horace wouldn't tell me, huh? Regulus feels himself blush. It wasn't that impressive. Please. I hear the scouts are already talking about you. You never know. You might be the youngest player to sign with a major team in Quidditch history. Honestly, Jamie. Don't we? Regulus almost says. Because they both know that even if he was approached by a team, next year, two years from now, well, Berger would never allow it. He is needed for the cause. Everything else is dust. Maybe. He looks out the window. The sky is nearly as grey as the wallpaper. They really keep you cooped up in here all the time. Bloody feelers. Won't let me do anything. They're only trying to help. That's certainly what they say. Regulus rolls his eyes, turning back to his father, who instantly holds his hands up in surrender. Merde, Regie. Don't look at me like that. I'm following orders, doing what they say. I swear, Mugt. You better be. I am, I am. Why do you think I'm so miserable, eh? He shoots Regulus a playful grin that the younger boy does his best to return. Okay, then. Okay, then. I don't sound like that. You absolutely do, Mugti. Instead of responding, Regulus reaches for one of the biscuits on the untouched plate in front of him, eyeing his father's thin frame as he takes his first bite. You're not eating. His father is a shell of what he once was. Shoulders slumped, skin hanging off his bones in unnatural ways. I eat. His father waves his hand dismissively, but Regulus only scowls, shoving the rest of his cookie in his mouth. Not enough. Ha! <laughs> Who's the parent here? I don't know, Regulus thinks. You tell me. But for the second time, he holds his tongue. His father pauses then, eyes flicking nervously towards the door. She's not here. Orion nods. Have you spoken to your brother? Regulus's heart drops. Sirius is a dangerous topic in this household, and he's not sure he's up for the task of walking through that minefield right now. Yes. He's not sure what else he can say. Not when his father is looking at him like that. He's... well. His father smiles softly. That's good. Regulus only nods, looking back out the window. There was a wedge between him and Sirius the moment his brother could escape. The moment he didn't have to rely on Regulus's company alone anymore. But it wasn't until last summer that Regulus thinks his brother really lost faith in him. It wasn't the night he left. Nothing so explosive and obvious. It was a quiet moment. Regulus leaning against the doorway of Sirius's bedroom. Sirius ignoring him. I don't know what you want me to do, Sirius. Sirius rubbed his eyes like talking with Regulus was exhausting. Maybe it was. I want you to fight back. Those were the first words he'd spoken to Regulus all day. Fight back. What's the point? Regulus answered before he could think better of it. Before he could remember who he was speaking to. Sirius had looked at him. Looked at him like he had never seen him before. Like he had no idea who he was. And maybe he didn't. Regulus. He's on his feet instantly, arms stiff at his sides as his mother opens the door to his room. She's a slight woman, dark hair pulled back tightly, dark robes pooling at her feet when she stands. She has Sirius's eyes. Mama. He stands motionless, unsure which of her faces intends to show itself today. Her eyes run him over before stepping forward, taking his chin sharply between her index finger and thumb. You look thin. He doesn't know what to say to that, so he says nothing remaining compliant and silent as she looks him over. 
And your hair is too long. He sometimes envies muggles, who have to put so much energy and intent behind all their actions, who have to walk everywhere and pick everything up and wait for things to finish. It all means so much less to wizards. It's all too easy, too quick. The words are barely out of his mother's mouth before he feels the icy fingers of her magic, curls falling lifeless at his feet. He looks down for a moment, mournful. Better. His mother steps back, admiring her handiwork. Your grades are good. The change in topic is sudden, but not surprising. Holberger is rarely wasteful with her words when it comes to her children. Yes. She nods. Come down. Supper's ready. Tomorrow your cousins will be here. Regulus feels her stomach clench as she walks towards the door. When are they coming? Noon. Holberger is in the hall, walking away when Regulus lets out a shaky breath, then lifts his hand to his newly cut hair. Well, cut. He's a bit generous. The hair is short and prickly and close to the scalp. Not completely gone, but about as short as it is possible to go. It shouldn't ache. He's not sure why it does. He vanishes the hair on the floor on his way out the door. He wants to fly, but there's no room. Not here in the city. Hidden behind layers and layers of secrecy charms. So he goes for a run instead. The air is crisp, the pavement freshly cleared of snow. Regulus can see his breath freeze outside his lips as he forces it out of his lungs again and again. He's not sure how long he's been gone for, but it's a while if the aching in his muscles is anything to go by. Still, it's not enough. He can't get himself to sit still, to quiet down. So he keeps going. Block after block. The sun is now fully in the sky. A bright day for December, though it has no warmth. He doesn't allow himself to think about anything except taking the next step, except fighting the weakness in his legs. He blocks out the world beyond London, beyond Grimmauld. He doesn't think about Hogwarts, or about anything that transpired within it. And whenever those thoughts or feelings try to drag themselves to the surface, he gets a new box. He digs a new hole. He buries himself deeper and deeper. He can barely stand when he gets home. Master Regulus has missed his breakfast. Regulus drags himself into the kitchen, showered and clothed and light-headed. Sorry, Creature. He sits down at the work table, watching the elf rush about, preparing for lunch. Creature is told by Mistress that he cannot feed Regulus now, that he will have to wait for his cousins. Regulus nods slowly, resting his chin on his folded arms and taking in a deep breath. It smells of caramelized onions and roast beef. His stomach responds accordingly. Creature shoots him a look over his shoulder, but Regulus doesn't move. I'll wait. But Creature only shakes his head. I cannot be feeding Master Regulus, you understand? I have been told so, so I will not. Regulus is opening his mouth to once again affirm that he understands when a plate of bread and cheeses appears in front of him. He would like to help Master Regulus very much, but he simply cannot go against his mistress's wishes. Regulus blinks, lifting his head up off his arms, a small smile pulling at his mouth. Thanks, creature. He reaches for the food, that much hungrier now that it is in front of him. Do not be thanking me. I am doing nothing. Regulus swears he sees the elf wink. Regulus has always liked the kitchen the best, maybe because it's the warmest place in the house, or because Creature always gives him some of what he's cooking. Probably, he imagines, it's because the rest of the family never really comes in here. Not even Sirius, when he was still around. It's a nice escape, a place where he can breathe a little easier. It's partially underground, the window above the sink level with the grass in the garden. The walls made of an untreated stone, the fireplace enormous and deep, allowing for all manner of cooking and brewing. The floor and table are unvarnished wood, Everything in this space is soft and natural and lacking the artifice that is strewn throughout the rest of the house. There are no portraits, no gaudy embellishments, nothing is covered in gold or ivory. Regulus imagines that this is what a real home is meant to feel like. He forces himself to relax as he eats, forces his shoulders down from his neck, forces his muscles to let go. Inhale, exhale, nothing matters. He's okay, this is okay. He's done it a dozen times before, there's no reason for it to be any different now. The feeling 
when it comes was like falling into a frozen lake, but slowly. It starts at his head and trickles through his body, his hands freezing on their way to his mouth, and then suddenly dropping back to the table. Stand, Stand up. up. And he does, before he can think about the fact that the voice isn't his own or that an unnatural calm has suddenly settled around his bones. Turn mm. around. Bellatrix is grinning at him, wild brown curls cascading down her back as Rodolphus throws himself into the chair beside Regulus, looking entirely bored by the situation. Oh, little Regulus. She presses the tip of her wand to his forehead, and he wants to move, he does, wants to knock it away, but he can't. He can't move. He can barely think. You never learn, do you? She draws her wand down his nose, his lips, flicking it off the edge of his chin. On On your knees. His body drops with a painful crack onto the hard stone floor. He can feel himself tremble, hear the laboured breath in his ears. She's in his head, in his skin. What trick should he do next? She stalks around him, hand running over his shaved head. Adolphus leans forward, elbows on his knees, face coming into view. Regulus can't turn his head, can't follow his cousin's path, can't look away from her husband's empty eyes. Fuck. An ugly smile stretches across his face. <laughs> bark. Bark, bark, bark. <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough. <laughs> Bellatrix stops in front of him. Stop. Stop. He goes quiet, throat raw, struggling to push back against her presence inside his head and failing. He fails every time. Bellatrix sticks out her foot, sleek black leather pushing into the centre of his chest. He barely notices. His ribs already feel too tight, his lungs barely able to breathe. Kiss it. He tries, really, tries to pull his willpower out from behind the veil of the spell. But it's nothing but a distant yell, a muffled voice. So he does as he's told. Doesn't he always? Oh, here you are. He can't see his mother because Bellatrix hasn't ordered him to look, hasn't allowed him to take his mouth off her shoe. But he doesn't need to. He would know her voice anywhere. There's a brief pause. He isn't sure what her face is doing, what she thinks about the scene in front of her. Come, lunch is ready. Narcissa and Lucius are in the dining room. Honestly, Regulus, you must learn to strengthen your mind. We've practiced this. They did. Over and over again. By the end of the summer, Regulus had felt raw with it, like his body had been turned inside out. He hears the sounds of his mother's shoes as she walks away. Pity. Bellatrix throws him off her foot. Looks like playtime's over. The spell lets go, and he comes crashing back down into his body, catching himself on his hands as they tremble along with the rest of him. Come now, little cousin. We don't want to keep your mamma waiting. He can't lift his head. It's too heavy. The room's spinning. He watches their feet, Rodolphus getting out of his chair, a pair of them sauntering into the hallway. Inhale. Exhale. His skin is clammy, drenched in a cold sweat. Inhale. Exhale. He barely has time to turn his head before he's retching all over the kitchen floor. He doesn't know how there can be so much when he's barely eating. You'd think, after all this time, he'd be used to this feeling, but it never gets easier being invaded. It never gets easier and he never gets stronger. Regulus collapses onto his back, chest heaving as he tries to focus on the soothing feeling of the cold floor on his skin. It's only a few moments before Creature's worried face appears above him. Master Regulus must be getting up now. He places a small hand on Regulus's back and helps him peel himself off the ground. There's a glass of water being pressed to Regulus's lips. He drinks gratefully. Thank you. Sorry about the... He gestures to the puddle of sick beside them, but Creature only shakes his head, leaving behind a clean floor. What is mess to a house elf? Regulus almost smiles. Regulus! He winces as he hands the water back to Creature and gets unsteadily to his feet. For a second, the room sways. Inhale. Exhale. Master Regulus? Reg tries to force a smile. It's fine, Creature. Just have to make it to the table, right? He doesn't have to see his face to know how pale he must look, how weak. Creature will send in soup. The regular shakes his head. No. Best not to change anything. You know how they are. Creature only stares back at him helplessly. 
Regulus keeps his hand pressed to the wall all the way down the hallway to steady himself, only taking it off the minute he comes into view. The dining room is largely taken up by a long black table. His mother is at the head, of course, his father nowhere to be seen. In bed, Regulus supposes. Bellatrix and Rodolphus on one side, Narcissa and Lucius on the other. There he is. Narcissa smiles at him, hair charmed blonde to match her fiancé's. She gets out of her chair and pulls him into a hug that Regulus does his best not to flinch away from. He does not want to be touched. Not right now. Merlin, you're so big. I can't believe it most of the time. He smiles stiffly as she pulls him into the seat next to her. Lucius nods his head in acknowledgement, and Regulus does the same, even though it makes his stomach roil. There are appetizers on the table, but Regulus isn't sure he can trust himself not to throw them back up just yet, so he chooses to focus on this plate. Eyes following the pattern, hands clenched in his lap. Inhale, exhale. Nothing matters. You were saying, Rodolphus. His mother gives him a detached once-over before returning her attention to her niece's husband. Mincham has agreed to put more dementors around Azkaban. He'll announce it next week. New security measures. Put all the troublesome Death Eaters in their place. <laughs> Regulus's eyes rise at that, at the bubbling laugh that comes out of Bellatrix's mouth. He doesn't know, then. Mincham? Not a clue. He's quite happy with Lucius and I for suggesting it. Here's a healing. Rodolphus rips into one of the buns on the table, gesturing to the man across from him. Appreciates our no-nonsense approach. <laughs> and the Dementors, we can rely on them. Rodolphus shrugs. Sure. For what we need. The Ministry's never done anything for them. And our Lord can be so very convincing. Whether or not they'll fight with us, I can't say. But I can promise they won't fight against us. They'll let the prisoners go, then. Narcissa leans forward slightly. Rodolphus nods. We go get him. The Dementors will let them walk. No question. Good. Regulus feels something start to scratch at the inside of his skin. It'll make it harder for them to slow us down. Not that they're able to do much of that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Smog looks are exchanged around the table. Suddenly, steaming pots and dishes appear before them. Ah, excellent. His mother sits up straighter. Everybody, lunch is served. Several hours later, they're still talking. Meals never last a reasonable time with them, drifting into the late afternoon and early evening. Once a sufficient number of brandies and wine glasses have been had, Regulus slips away. It's a relief, the quiet darkness of his room. For a moment, he leans his forehead against the wall and exhales. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. He thinks about visiting his father, but he's worried he'll wake him up. Or that they'd hear him downstairs. That they'd realise he'd left. No. Better to stay here. Quiet. It wasn't until last summer that he realised what a shield Sirius had been for him. It was easy to disappear when his brother was around. Pathetic, he knew, but Sirius always handled it so well got up from every hit like he couldn't even feel it. Nothing seemed to touch him. Meanwhile, to Regulus, everything feels like water in his lungs. The door opens and Regulus whips his head around, Lucius knocking the wand out of his hand with the flick of his own. Hiding, are you? The older man smiles, crowding him against the wall. His breath smells of alcohol. Go away, Lucius. He doesn't look at his face, but somewhere off his left shoulder, safer that way. Tusk, Tusk. It's not very nice of you. He grabs hold of Regulus's jaw, pulling it forward with a grip that will no doubt bruise. We've talked about that mouth of yours. For the second time that day, Regulus feels like he's going to be sick. Lucius is too close. Too fucking close, and he can't... He can't breathe. He can't stand all these hands on him. It makes something deep inside him ache. He would speak, but Lucius's grip is too tight. His mouth too suffocating, pressing into him. Inhale, exhale. Nothing matters. If nothing matters, then nothing hurts. Regulus brings his knee to meet Lucius's stomach, taking the older man by surprise, which is enough to let Regulus throw him off, making a dive for his wand, which sits on the floor by the door. 
His fingers have only just wrapped around the handle when he feels a sharp pain shoot through him. Lucius's pointed dress shoe ramming itself into his side. He isn't fast enough. He never is. Suddenly, he finds himself on his back. Lucius's foot pressing down on his chest. The hell are you doing, you little brat? His wand is aimed at Regulus's face. His chest struggles against Lucius's weight. I'm not doing this, Lucius. I'm not doing this anymore. Lucius arches his eyebrow. You're not doing this anymore? He pushes down on Regulus for emphasis. <sighs> They'll notice you've gone. He's feeling desperate now, hand groping around on the floor for his wand, not sure where it went after he got kicked. A sickening leer carves itself into Lucius's mouth. You think they'll care? Narcissa will care. So, if you want her to pump out your pure blood pups, you'll get the fuck out of my room before I start screaming. Regulus never knows what Sirius would do in these situations. Though he imagines he probably doesn't find himself in them very often. Nobody looks at Sirius and thinks, weak. Lucius' eyes are intense as he bends forward, bringing their faces closer together and tilting his to the side. Like Regulus is an exhibit he's trying to puzzle out. And then he smiles. Oh, Regulus. Have you found yourself a boy? Regulus grits his teeth, feeling the box rattle down inside him. But he keeps it closed. He keeps it buried. Keeps his thoughts empty of faces and voices and hands that never ask for more than he can give. Does he know that this is what you're really like? <laughs> A worm, pathetic and groveling and used. It shouldn't hurt. He doesn't know why it does. A few moments of tense silence pass before Lucius straightens up, taking his foot off Regulus and smoothing out his robes. Have it your way. <coughs> but, you know... He pauses by the door, the light from the hallway cutting brutally through the dark room. You'll figure it out eventually. What a sad little thing you are. And I can't imagine he'll want you after that. Regulus doesn't move until he's alone again, sitting up against the wall and pulling his knees in, resting his head on top of them. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. He wonders, absentmindedly, if other people have to remind themselves to breathe, or if that's just him. You see, Roger Flint was the first boy who didn't care what Regulus wanted, but he wasn't the last. I want you to fight back. That's what Sirius had said. The truth is, Regulus doesn't stay because he feels very strongly about his family's cause about the supremacy of purebloods. He supposes maybe they have a point sometimes. He isn't sure. But really, Regulus stays because he doesn't think Sirius' side can win. That they stand any chance at all. His parents, their friends, they have so much power. So much money and influence. I want you to fight back, Sirius had said. But what's the point? What's the point of fighting for a lost cause? Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells. Regulus spends Christmas morning with his father. The creature helps him bring him down to the living room, where the fire is lit and the tree is sparkling, and his father makes him open all his gifts like he's still a little kid. They drink hot chocolate and eat pancakes. His mother is out. She has meetings. According to his father, she has a lot of those these days, though he's rather vague about who they're with or what they're about. Regulus doesn't push the matter. He doesn't really want to know. Do you remember when you were six? I already don't like where this is going. Regulus is on the floor. He's resting on his hand, legs stretched out in front of him as he looks up at his father. He's still in his pyjamas, even though it's nearly one. His father, too. Though these days, he's rarely in anything else. No, no. This is a good one. His father grins. Uh-huh. I'm not sure our definitions of good are the same, but go on. Oh, he pense qu'il est si drôle. A little respect wouldn't kid you, huh? He winks at Regulus, who rolls his eyes. You're barely up to here. He holds his hand out at waist height. 
and you followed Sirius around everywhere you went. You two are absolutely inseparable. I followed him everywhere until the day he got on that train. Regulus thinks, but doesn't say. His father is rarely in so good a mood, and he doesn't want to ruin it. And it had snowed all night. The hills were practically up to my neck. You're exaggerating, Papa. I am not. There'll be pictures somewhere, I'm sure. Anyway, we turned our backs on you for two seconds. I swear we were, I don't know, having a brandy in the salon or something. Then you were gone. Oof. We were six and seven. I find it hard to believe we were quite that stealthy. Oh, but you were. We searched the whole house, calling out your names. Your mother was absolutely beside herself. And then I looked out the window. I saw a little red shirt tied to a stick on top of a snowbank. Regulus actually does remember this. Remembers how badly his hands stung from digging in the snow. Remembers how pleased he was when Sirius told him he was doing a good job. So, we go outside only to see that you two have turned the entire back garden into a snow fort. And Sirius comes wandering out and informs us, quite formally, that we are now on his property. Regulus remembers that too. Remember staying behind, inside their little snow tunnels, watching Sirius face their parents alone. Always alone. Said he was going to be living in his fault, and that since he was no longer under our roof, he no longer had to follow our rules. <coughs> are, you, are you okay, Papa? Regulus moves forward, placing his hand on his father's back. I'm fine, Reggie, I'm fine. <coughs> he leans back in his chair. You two were such a pair. He smiles to himself. You still speak at school, yes? Yes, Papa. Yes. All the time. Good. That's good. His eyes drift closed. It doesn't take much these days to wear him out. La famille est importante, mon cher. Ton frère pas dessus de tout. Il s'en remettra. He'll come back. No. Regulus doesn't have the heart to tell him. No. I don't think he will. Perhaps it'd be time to be returning Master Black to his bed. Regulus starts at Creature's sudden appearance, hand tightening protectively over his father before he forces himself to relax. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. He looks back down. Come on, Papa. Let's get you upstairs, okay? His father doesn't put up nearly the fight Regulus expects him to. <sighs> Regulus helps him into bed pulling the blankets all the way up to his shoulders. He's asleep almost as soon as he puts his head on the pillow. Joyeux Noël, Papa. He pauses for a moment, remembering that day in the snow. Sirius had been so excited. This is ours, he told Regulus. It'll be just us here. They can't come in. Walburga took his voice for that. One flick of a wand, and Sirius couldn't speak for three days. That, of course was not part of their father's story. It never was. Regulus makes it all the way to the hall outside his bedroom before he stops, looking across the way to the other door. He hasn't seen it open since last summer. Since he left. It's foolish, really. Stupid. But he finds himself moving towards it anyway. Finds his hand turning the knob. It even still smells like Sirius. Hair products and leather boots. The walls are covered in red and gold lions roaring overhead. For days last summer, the mother had sat in this room trying to peel them off. But whatever spell Sirius used was strong because not a single poster came down. He hadn't had time to take anything the night he left, so his room remains unchanged. Like any minute, he might walk back in. Regulus takes a tentative step forward, towards the familiar bed, hands trailing along the walls and dresses, like he's trying to make sure they're really there. He used to spend a lot of time in this room, reading, playing, hiding from monsters. It feels different from the rest of the house. Even when he's gone, Sirius still has so much presence. He bleeds out of every corner. Undeniable. A force. Regulus sits down on the bed, eyes roaming over the room, catching on a picture on the bedside table. Shaking, his hand reaches out for it, framed in a clunky plastic thing. It's of Sirius and his friends, somewhere in Hogwarts, maybe third year. James is caught in a laugh, smile spread big across his face as he throws his head back. Regulus knows that laugh. 
He knows what it sounds like and feels like and tastes like. The box strains inside him, begging him to open it up, to think of all the things he can't afford to right now. Not while he's in this house that is so hungry to tear things apart. Still, he slips off the back of the frame and slides the photo into his pocket. Stupid. He lets out a breath, eyes sweeping over the room one last time before he gets up and heads back into the corridor. What are you doing? He freezes with his hand on the knob. Regulus. His mother is standing at the top of the stairs. What were you doing in there? He almost laughs. Because, of course. Of course she comes home now. I wanted to see if his Quidditch gear fit. Are you lying to me? She steps nearer and Regulus tries to get his pulse under control. The hair raising on the back of his neck as her dark eyes zero in on him. No. But of course, it's too late. He knows what's going to happen even before she raises her wand. Before she whispers the spell. Hedgelements. It burns when she forces her way into his thoughts. Flipping through them like the pages of a book. They whip before his mind's eye at breakneck speed, making him feel dizzy. But he was careful. He was ready. He's put all the things that could hurt him away. He's buried them deep. She won't find them. She won't. Except for the picture. She grabs hold of it, focusing in on the moving faces of the young boys. Oh, Regulus thinks pathetically, hoping she doesn't hear, trying to quiet his own thoughts, but they persist. No, leave them alone. Leave him alone, she pulls back. Give it to me. He stares at her, unsure of why this feels like such a betrayal. Regulus, now. Slowly, he reaches for the photograph, barely getting it out of his pocket before she's ripping it away from him. Eyes never leaving his face even when she sets it on fire, letting it drop to the floor and curl in on itself, turning to ash. He is not your brother. Regulus almost sighs with relief that she couldn't tell who he was focusing on. Do you understand? We, oui, Maman. Her shrewd eyes run him up and down, sending shivers along his spine. This summer, you will take the mark. He blinks. What? It's past time. Things are happening, Regulus, and you need to take your place. Sirius's place, you mean? But he doesn't say it out loud. I'm not finished school. He knows, of course, that this won't matter. And you needn't be. As if they teach you anything of quality anyway. I only allowed you to return this year because your father insisted. He says nothing. He has nothing to say. Nothing that won't end with him in pain, anyway. Things are changing, Regulus. She walks away, the picture a cold pile of ash on the floor. And nothing will be the same once we're done. He wonders if she means for it to sound like a threat. He imagines she probably does. It was Sirius who taught him the trick with the box. Taught him how to hide things in his own head. He wonders if his brother still does it sometimes. Still hides parts of himself away. Or if now that he's free of this place, he doesn't need to. If he gets to remember without fear. He'd like to ask him. He's sure he never will. He has Creature drop him off in London. He's two hours early for the train, but he can't stand being in that house anymore. He doesn't go to Diagon Alley like he said he would, or to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Instead, he finds a bench in the Muggle train station and sits, leaning back and closing his eyes, listening to the crowds rushing round him, trains arriving and departing. A voice that echoes from above, buzzing in his ears every five seconds as it announces the various trains. He feels delicate, a nervous shaking inside his skin that promises it won't take much to pull him apart. Regulus? He startles, eyes flying open, heart jolting against his ribs. His wand is in a holster on the inside of his arm, but he doesn't dare pull it out here. A middle-aged woman stands over him. She has dark brown hair with a single white streak at the front that has been braided down her back. Her face is kind. She smiles softly at him. I'm Euphemia Potter. She holds out her hand. Regulus feels something shoot through his chest, something pull at his gut. He blinks up at her and then down at her hand. Sorry, Mrs. Potter. It's nice to meet you. He reaches out and takes her hand, her grip warm and strong. Now that she's said it, he can't not see it. The similarities between her and her son. The box rattles again, with all the feelings and thoughts he still doesn't feel strong enough to face. Not now. Not yet. It'll be too much. 
Can I sit with you? She nods to the empty spot beside him. Oh, yes, of course. He doesn't know what to do with his hands. Eventually he finds them fidgeting in his lap, his eyes unable to meet her gaze. I see you're an early bird too, huh? The boys have gone to Diagon, but I've always liked this station. Excellent place for people watching. The boys? He's not sure he can manage this conversation right now. He already feels on the verge of coming apart. Are you excited for the new term? I hear you have a Quidditch game soon? That gets him to look up, meeting her stare head on. He has experience in holding stares, but hers is different. A different kind of intense. Have you? Her smile becomes a bit more mischievous. Oh yes. I've heard about the faint you pulled so many times I feel I was there myself. He swallows with difficulty, unsure of what to do with the knowledge that he's been a topic of conversation in the Potter household. You know, my son is a bit of an open book. Regulus does know. He's obsessed with it. He's afraid of it. I'm never sure if that means I've done something right as a mother or something wrong, but it's too late now either way, I suppose. Her eyes drift out calmly over the rushing people in front of them. But gosh, did he ever light up when he talked about you. She looks back at him, and suddenly his chest feels too tight. Please stop, he wants to tell her, but he's not sure he means it. Part of him is greedy, is hungry, is desperate for more. Regulus, I want you to know that our door is always open, okay? If you ever need it. It's all a bit too much, if he's being honest. He's had too many people in his head recently, too many hands on his skin. There is nothing stable about him. He is all... Weak foundations and cracking beams. His body ready to cave in on itself. I... <coughs> I should go. The train. Even though they both know he has plenty of time. Still, she nods her head, smiling all the same. Of course. Don't let me keep you. He gets up shakily, hoping he can make it through the barrier in this state. It was nice to meet you, Mrs. Potter. Effie, please. He nods, though he knows he will never call her that. He wonders if Sirius does, or if he just calls her Mum. It's a title that suits her far more than it ever has his own mother. His body feels awkward and out of place as he walks away from her through the crowd, none of his limbs moving the right way. Inhale, exhale. Nothing matters. He sleeps for most of the train ride. Evan and Barty bickering with one another in the seats across from him. He makes a point of not looking at anyone on the platform when they arrive, or in the Great Hall at dinner. Hours later, he finds himself sitting alone in the Slytherin common room, unable to concentrate on his readings, or do any of the coursework he neglected over the break. He stares into the fire and wonders if he shouldn't just go to bed. If he shouldn't just let this whole thing die. Of course, he's thought that before. Thought it nearly every time. It's not really a question, when the answer is so obvious. He should. Of course he should. Especially in the state he's in. His foot taps nervously on the floor, eyes flicking up from the fire to the clock on the mantel. He should just go to bed. It would be better for both of them. He should. He should. He should. He, he doesn't, of course. But he should. He wonders how James will know to come now that he won't be able to see Regulus on the map. He wonders if he'll remember how to get in. He wonders if the room would keep him out if Regulus asked it to. He doesn't ask it to, that is. But he thinks about it. He makes a concentrated effort not to look at the bed, not to remember the last time he was in this room. The box still closed, though cracks have started to splinter it. Have started to let things leak through. He isn't at all sure he can handle this. Isn't at all sure how to. It's never been this bad. He's never felt this broken apart. It was too quiet in that house. Too cold. And now all of a sudden, there are so many people and voices and so much heat that he feels like he's burning up. You cut your hair. Regulus's head snaps up. He doesn't know how he missed the sound of the door opening. And oh. Oh. Oh shit. Something yanks at his chest. Yanks hard. This was a bad idea. He knew this was a bad idea. Yes. It feels like James is waiting for some kind of response and that's all he has. Truthfully, he'd forgotten about his hair. He's been avoiding mirrors lately. Avoiding being confronted with his own face. 
It's easier that way. I like it. James smiles. He's being nice. Regulus knows what he looks like. Severe. Cold. Bare. James steps forward. Regulus having positioned himself at the back wall, across from the door. Can I... No. The word is out of Regulus so fast he can barely believe he said it. And instantly James stops. Hands dropping to his sides. He looks like he always does. Perfect. Hair a mess. Glasses smudged. Perfect. Inhale. Exhale. Nothing matters. Okay. This is no doubt not the reunion he thought he was going to be getting. Regulus knows that he's hurting him. Knows that he shouldn't have come. James leans against the back of the sofa. You have a good Christmas? Regulus wants to laugh. He doesn't. Sure. It was fine. Yours? It's hard to concentrate. It's been hard to concentrate all day. Maybe longer than that. It's always a bit of a culture shock, returning to school after being at Grimmauld Place. But this? This is next level. You had to hide too much of yourself this time, says the voice in his head. He thinks it's probably right. Reg. The last time I saw you, I was happy. Regulus. The last time I saw you, my mother was trying to rip you out of my head. Regulus. It's clear that he's been speaking, and Regulus hasn't heard a word of it. Sorry. Not feeling well. The shaking has started, and it's work to keep it out of his voice. He can see how desperately James wants to close the space between them, but he doesn't. Doesn't take a single step. Do you want me to take you to the hospital wing? You can't take me to the hospital wing. Because someone might see us, he lets remain unsaid. No one's going to see us at this hour. Regulus shakes his head. You don't know that. Besides, I don't want to go there anyway. I just want to go back to my room. I just want to sleep. Pain, imperfectly suppressed by James Potter's beautiful face. I've been in love with you since I was 11 years old, he thinks. Okay, if that's what you want. Regulus nods, letting him stay in tense silence only a minute longer before he somehow manages to force his legs to move. He doesn't look at James. Reg. Part of him doesn't want to stop. He's so close. So close to being out of here. So close to being free of the growing ache in his chest, of the cracking in his bones, but he does stop. Looking behind him to find James unmoved, face broken open. I missed you. He gives him a weak smile, and Regulus feels his hand tightened around the doorknob in front of him in an attempt to stay standing. I'll see you tomorrow. He doesn't wait to see what effect those words have on James before he throws himself into the hallway. He just needs to get back to his room. He just needs to close his eyes. He just needs to not be awake for a little bit. Regulus shoves his hands in his pockets as he moves through the hallways, steps determined, focused. Inhale. Exhale. Nothing matters. If nothing matters, then nothing hurts. Black. Fancy seeing you here. Regulus's steps stutter, but don't stop. He knows that voice. Knows it without even looking for it. Well, that's not very polite. Severus Snape falls into step beside him. Following me now, are you? Regulus's eyes are very determinedly forward as he makes a conscious effort to keep his breath at a reasonable pace. Actually, I had other business to attend to, but two birds, one stone. Seemed like an excellent opportunity to remind you of that favour you still owe me. I don't owe you shit. He's too tired for this. Too broken for this. Ah, uh, 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 I think you'll find that that's not true. Unless you want a certain rumour going around. Ugh, please, enough with the empty threats. You're not going to tell anyone anything. I wouldn't be so sure. Regulus stops so abruptly that Snape nearly trips over himself trying to do the same. You want in, Snape? Huh? You want in on the cause? You want to run around with Mulciba and Avery and call yourself a Death Eater? Then I would watch your fucking mouth around me. Snape looks back at him, clearly taken off guard, and Regulus sneers in a way he knows makes him look like his mother. You are no one. Regulus feels the anger and the fear and the pain of the last two weeks straining against his skin. Your mother is no one. Your muggle father is no one. You think they'll let you join without the help of people like me? <laughs> when you have blood thicker than that mudblood, you can't get to fuck you. It happens fast. One minute they're facing each other, and the next Snape has him pressed up against the wall. Whatever was holding Regulus together snaps then. Like a dam, it all comes crashing forth. Everything he'd been trying to keep controlled, keep buried. And he can't breathe. He can't breathe. He tries. He tries, but nothing is working. He 
inhale, inhale, come on, inhale. He's 11 years old and Roger Flint is crushing him. Inhale, inhale, inhale. He's trapped in his bedroom, Lucius Malfoy's foot on his chest. Inhale, inhale, inhale. He knows that Snape is talking, spitting venom in his face, but Regulus can't hear him. He wonders if anyone has ever died like this before, because the heart just gave up. Oi! Get the fuck off him! The second that Snape's grip is pried from his shoulders, he collapses. Legs unable to support him, but nothing changes. The horrible feelings clawing at his skin. The pain. The pain that hurts so much more now. It doesn't go away. Inhale. 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 Bellatrix is in his head. He can't move. He can't blink. His mother is flipping through his memories. His brother is walking out the door. Inhale. 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 What's going on in here? He's vaguely aware of the third voice. Vaguely aware that something has been going on around him. Bodies, spells, feet shuffling on the stone floor. He's rocking back and forth, nails digging into his knees. Inhale. 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 There's talking. Voices. He knows there is. Doesn't know what they're saying, though. Doesn't think it matters. What can they do to him? What else can they do? Regulus. James comes into view, kneeling in front of him, hands held out but not touching. He can feel his magic. He can always feel his magic. Sweet and warm, it curls around him but doesn't squeeze. Regulus tries to hold on to that. Tries to use it as a rope to pull himself out of whatever hole he's fallen into. But it doesn't work. Regulus? His eyes are pleading, and it's not until that moment that Regulus realises that he's been hearing James Potter's voice in his head the whole time. Regulus, I need you to breathe, okay? Inhale. Exhale. He opens his mouth to speak, but he can't. So he just shakes his head, squeezing his eyes shut. Okay. It's okay. You're okay. And Regulus wonders how he manages to say it without choking. So, it turns out my mum knows about Patroclus and Achilles. Don't ask me how. She's a bit mad like that. I'm pretty sure she knows everything, honestly. Anyway, I started reading the Iliad, which I thought was going to be a bit more, you know, soppy. But it's mostly a bunch of guys killing each other. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. He doesn't know if he's crying. He hopes that he's not. And, like, obviously, I'm all for the Greeks, but I've got to be honest, I kind of like Hector. His eyes open and the world is blurry. So he is crying then. <laughs> of course you like Hector. And oh, how James smiles at that. Slow and soft. There you are. Regulus realises that it's true. He's shaking and crying and not at all confident that he can stand up, but he's breathing again. Thank Merlin, he's breathing again. Mr. Porter! The voice makes Regulus look up, a wave of nausea washing over him as he sees Filch and Snape standing there. Snape's nose is bleeding, his shirt collar torn. Mr. Potter, take Mr. Black to the hospital wing, and then get back to your dorm. I'll be telling McGonagall and Slughorn all about this. No doubt I'll see you in detention tomorrow. Yes, sir. James doesn't hesitate, still crouched on the floor. Come on, you! Filch nudges Snape down the hall. Snape, whose eyes have not stopped bouncing between James and Regulus. Go on! Filch gives him another push and Snape reluctantly tears his eyes away from them, allowing himself to be nearly dragged in the direction of the Slytherin dorms. Regulus. Regulus reaches forward, tugging on his shirt, pulling him close. Whoa, hey. There's some shuffling. James moving so that his back is against the wall, pulling Regulus into his lap like a little kid, but he doesn't care, pressing his face into James's chest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Shh. Hey, no. It's okay, Reg. You're okay. And none of that is true, but he doesn't bother trying to correct him. James runs his hand soothingly up and down Regulus's back, kissing the top of his head. It's okay. And Regulus nods. We're in the hallway. 
What he says is stupid, but James seems to understand. Regulus feels him shuffling underneath him, pulling out his wand, he thinks. A few seconds later, something is draped over the heads. Regulus blinks, looking up. Did you just cover us with a cloak? James nods. Invisibility cloak. Regulus stares at him. You have an invisibility cloak. Surprise. Regulus shakes his head, pressing his face back into James's shirt. <laughs> Magic map. Invisibility cloak. You're ridiculous. <laughs> so I've been told. It's warm in James's arms, so they stay like that. Regulus unwilling to move. James probably afraid to. She cuts my hair. He thinks he might be crying again. He doesn't know why. James nods. It'll grow back. He presses another kiss to the top of Regulus's head. Besides, I told you, I like it. Very badass. <laughs> Ridiculous. James knows he's overprotective. Really, he does. He's not sure why. Not sure where it comes from. He's never lost anyone. Never had anyone walk away from him. He hasn't lived through what Sirius has. What Remus has. There's no reason for him to have this deep need to protect when nothing has ever been taken from him. But he does. If you wanted to be cute, and sometimes his mother does, you could call it the Gryffindor in him. But it's more than that. It scares him sometimes, if he's honest. It's too... intense. He feels it about Sirius, about Remus, about Peter. This need to be at their sides. To make sure they're okay. To destroy anything and anyone who tries to touch them. Because they're his. His to protect. His to keep. His to love. It's too much. He knows it is. It's worse with Regulus. He doesn't like Snape. Whatever Lily says, he doesn't see much that's redeemable about the kid. But he's glad that Filch showed up when he did. Glad that he pulled them apart. Because for a minute when he came around that corner, when he saw Snape with Regulus pressed against the wall, he doesn't actually think he was going to kill him. He hopes he wasn't. But Merlin, he wanted to. He felt the need burn under his skin. He wouldn't have needed magic. Wouldn't have needed a wand. He'd have done it with his bare hands. And that scares him. Scares him almost as much as the way Regulus shakes in his arms. The way he cries silently into his chest. James has never felt his age quite so much as when he was crouched on the floor trying to get Regulus to breathe. All he could think was, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Someone help. Someone get my mum. It hurts. People hurt. Even when they don't mean to. Even when it isn't their fault. It hurts to see Remus the morning after a full moon, which is a selfish thing to feel, or to think, but it's true. It hurts to see him broken and battered and filled with loneliness. Just like it hurt to watch Regulus fall apart. He knows it isn't about him. None of it is. But it hurts like it's his. And he's sorry. And he wishes he was stronger. Wishes he was more. Wishes he wasn't the only person he knew who wasn't covered in scars. We're going to have to move. Regulus is still pressed against him, invisibility cloak over the heads. James's arms instinctively tighten around him. Let's go back to the room. Can we do that? He realises he shouldn't be making demands right now. But the idea of letting Regulus go back to that dorm. The idea that Snape might be waiting for him. Filch might check the room if you went back to your dorm. James shakes his head. I've already got one detention. Another won't make much of a difference. I'm asking, Reg. It's a question you can say no. You can always say no. He knows he handled things wrong before. Knows he looked disappointed when Regulus turned him away. He's never been good at guarding his emotions. He hates that he did that. That he made him think for even a minute that he had to do anything he didn't want to. I know. Regulus burrows further into James's chest. His hand goes to the back of his head, holds him there. I love you. I love you. I'm so sorry I wasn't there. I'm so sorry that someone hurt you and I couldn't stop it. 
I'm so sorry that I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay, let's go. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yes, James. It's a slow process, getting Regulus back on his feet. James suggests carrying him, but Regulus sends him a look so sharp James can't believe he isn't bleeding from it. He keeps one hand around Regulus's waist and the other holding up the invisibility cloak, even though it doesn't quite cover their feet. He figures some coverage is better than none, and he's not at all certain that Filch isn't coming back. By the time they make it to the room, he thinks they're both exhausted. He tosses the cloak over a nearby chair, Regulus collapsing onto the bed, leaving James standing awkwardly by the door. He wants desperately to be closer, but knows better than to move. He may not understand where it comes from, Regulus's fear of hands and bodies and touch. But he knows that Regulus hates it, that he's almost ashamed of it, and that he'll let James cross boundaries if he pushes. Clearly it's something Regulus has grown used to, so James is so, so careful not to push. Do you have practice tomorrow morning? Regulus shakes his head, still lying on his back. No. You? Of course. Frank's a complete tyrant. Please. You love it. Maybe. James feels shaky, even as they fall into familiar patterns. But I don't want him to know that. No, I suppose not. There's another pause, the fire burning low, somehow anticipating their level of exhaustion. I'll sleep on the sofa, yeah? James. He knows that tone. Here's the pain in it. The fear. It's all right, Reg. I don't mind. Really. <sighs> Has it ever occurred to you that you should mind? That you should want more? More than... No. It hasn't. Regulus kicks his shoes off before wiggling so that he's sitting up against the headboard. He looks exhausted. Like he hasn't slept the whole time he's been gone. There are craters hanging under his eyes, his skin pale, his hands unable to stay still, constantly fidgeting in his lap or with his sleeve. Okay, the sofa. But can you come here first? Regulus looks nervous as he admits this. When James had walked in here the first time, it had been hard not to react to the boy in front of him. Regulus had been swaying against the back wall, eyes barely able to focus, body held so tightly James was afraid he was going to snap. At least now he's present, but it's... it's all laced with a new kind of fear, one that's closer to the surface. Sure, Ridge. He sits on the edge of the bed, leaving space between them. After a few moments, Regulus reaches out, playing with James's fingers, slowly, carefully. James doesn't move. What happened? Regulus doesn't look up from their hands. With Snape. I wasn't really... I didn't really see. James blinks, surprised by the question, really feeling that he ought to be the one asking. I heard you two arguing, or, well, I heard Snape, anyway. He wasn't exactly keeping his voice down. So I followed the noise, and when I found you, he... he had you pinned against the wall. Regulus's hand stills and James feels the anger course through him again. That desire to rip Snape to shreds. <sighs> so I pulled him off you and he took a swing at me. Regulus looks up at that, squinting. He hit you? <laughs> Not very well. Snivellus has never excelled at physical altercations. You would know, I guess. Hmm. James nods non-committally. Anyway, I hit him back. Somewhat more effectively, I noticed. James thinks he catches the hint of a smile in Regulus's mouth. Mostly we just shoved each other around a bit. He shot off a spell at some point, but it missed by a mile. Regulus doesn't respond right away, still playing with James's fingers. I think he knows. James raises his eyebrow. Knows? About... us. Is that why you two got into it? <laughs> No. No, that was... well. Anyway, the way he was looking at us when Filch dragged him off. I think he knows. I don't know. It's not like we were snogging or anything. We weren't behaving... platonically. <laughs> I mean, we could have been. 
I'd have helped any of my friends out the same. Grey eyes look up, tired. But we're not friends. James doesn't have an answer for that. Doesn't even know where to start. Eventually, Regulus pulls his hand back into his own lap. I'm just warning you, because if I were Snape, the first person I would go to would be serious. He still doesn't know what the right thing to say here is. What it is that Regulus wants to hear. It'll be his word against ours. He hasn't got any way to prove it. Regulus leans back against the headboard, breathing in and out in that way he does sometimes, like he has to think about it. Since when do you need proof to spread a rumour at this school? Besides, that's why he'll go to Sirius. He won't need to prove it. He'll just need to make Sirius doubt you. Which he will. James hates this conversation. Will he? Regulus rolls his head sleepily towards him, eyes opening again. Yes. It's what we do. Doubt and doubt and doubt. Everything gets all twisted in that house. Love and hate and all the rest. You can't trust anyone. You can't even trust yourself. James aches for the both of them. He wishes that he could fix it, that he could stop them from ever being hurt at all. He trusts me. Regulus nods. And you're lying to him. James feels the air escape from his lungs like he's just been hit. He's not entirely sure he hasn't been. He makes to stand up, but Regulus's hand shoots out, wrapping around his wrist. Sleepy eyes suddenly wide. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said that. I'm not... I'm not very good right now. I'm all... all the worst parts of me. I'm sorry. I'm... sorry. James breathes in, trying to put out the fires those words started in his chest. Because he hadn't thought about it like that. Not really. Not fully. He knows that he is one of the few people that Sirius trusts, that he's ever trusted, but it never occurred to him before that he wasn't worthy of it. Regulus is still staring at him with frightened eyes. It's okay, Rich. It's not. It was just the truth. But the younger boy shakes his head. I was being cruel. I told you I'm... I'm not very nice. I try to be. For you. He grimaces at the confession. I'm the one who made you promise not to tell anyone. It isn't fair for me to throw it back in your face. Regulus. He holds the other boy's eyes. You don't have to be nice all the time, you know. Nobody is. Says you. Regulus looks at him sceptically. I'll have you know there are plenty of people who think I'm an asshole. This doesn't seem to sway Regulus. They think you're an idiot. There's a difference. <laughs> that sound melts some of the ice in Regulus's eyes. You may be right. I am. Regulus looks down at where he's still holding onto James's wrist, and then, slowly, and almost painfully sweet, he brings James's knuckles to his mouth and kisses them. It's soft and quick, like something he wanted so badly he couldn't help it. His cheeks are slightly pink when he puts James's hand back down again. James wonders how it is that Regulus can be so forward about so much else and so unsure of the littler things like this. I should let you sleep. James's heart is trying to slip between his ribs. There are so many words crowding behind Regulus's lips, he can see them. See Regulus swallow them down. He wishes that just once he wouldn't. That just once he would tell James all the things he thinks are too terrible to utter. The parts of him too ugly to show. I can take it, James wants to say. Trust me. Thank you. For what? The younger boy shakes his head. All of it. Everything. They watch one another for too long before James eventually gets to his feet. He reaches his hand out, slowly, pausing before they touch. Can I? There's a moment of hesitation before Regulus nods. Yes. James holds his face, thumbs brushing over his cheeks as Regulus closes his eyes, leaning into the touch. James bends forward and presses a kiss to the top of his head before pulling away. I'm not going anywhere, Regulus. The younger boy blinks his eyes open. So serious and stoic. I know. I mean it.
Regulus looks almost sad for a minute before he's able to wipe his expression clean. Neutral. I know you do. He considers pushing the matter, but decides against it. Not tonight. Good night, Twitch. Good night, James. James is slightly better at sneaking back into his dorm, using the invisibility cloak to make sure he gets upstairs unseen. Unfortunately, Sirius is already awake for Quidditch, and there isn't really a subtle way for James to just... appear. Sirius doesn't seem surprised when James takes off the invisibility cloak. He just gives him a cold once-over from where he's sitting on his bed. I... I was just... Better hurry up. Sirius gets to his feet, grabbing his book. Don't want to keep Frank waiting. With that, he brushes past him and out of the room, shutting the door a bit too forcefully considering their other two roommates are still sleeping. Sirius gives James the silent treatment for the rest of the morning, which James thinks is a little unfair, but he tries to ignore it. All he gets is glowering and grumbling and sarcastic huffs every time he opens his mouth. By the end of breakfast, he's about ready to throttle Sirius. Luckily, Remus, being the perceptive lad he is, makes sure to sit between them in charms and then again in potions. By lunch, things are actually starting to feel a little more relaxed. That is, until James hears the unmistakable sound of McGonagall clearing her throat. Professor. <coughs> he puts down his sandwich and turns toward her. Really? Potted? Fighting? In the corridor? In the middle of the night? James can feel the eyes of each of his friends boring into him, Sirius's especially. What on earth possessed you to act so foolishly? After an extended silence, James realises that she actually expects an answer from him. Uh, uh, I was sleepwalking? She arches a formidable eyebrow. Really? And you just happened to sleepwalk right into Mr. Snape? James rubs the back of his neck. Yeah, mad coincidence, that. Mm -hmm. Her eyes run him up and down, clearly unimpressed. A week's detention. Oh, come on, Professor. And ten points from Gryffindor. Professor, you know Slughorn's not going to take anything from Slytherin for this. <laughs> How my fellow professors deal with their houses is none of my business. You, Mr. Potter, ought to know better. You're in fifth year, for goodness sake. James doesn't understand how that's relevant to anything, but he can't see the point in trying to fight with her. Your detention starts tonight, after supper, 6.30. Filch will be waiting for you in the trophy room. You are to be punctual and contrite. Have I made myself clear? Yes, Professor. She nods curtly and walks away. James turns back to his sandwich. Oh, and Mr. Potter, if this happens again, I promise you, the consequences will be far more severe. James rolls his eyes, though only once he's certain she's no longer looking. Brilliant. It takes him a minute to realise that the other three marauders are still staring at him and he tries to figure out if there's any way he can avoid having the conversation that is clearly coming. You got into a fight with Snape? Apparently not. James looks guiltily up at the confused faces of his friends. Well, Remus and Peter look confused. Sirius looks angry. Sort of, yeah. Sort of? James shrugs. Don't know why you're acting like this is some big deal. You get into scrapes with Snivellus all the time. Not usually in the middle of the night. Yeah, well, what can I say? The bloke's a tool 24-7. No rest for the wicked, eh? He tries to smile, but doesn't appear to appease a single one of his friends. What the hell were you even doing out of bed? Peter looks the most genuinely confused out of the bunch. James shrugs again, looking down at his plate. Walking. Ha! Oh. Sirius pushes away from the table. Unbelievable. Pads? Sirius is already walking away without a backwards glance. James watches him. He must have forgotten something in the room. Remus eyes James nervously. James stares for a moment longer before dropping his eyes. Yeah. Must have. Sirius's mood continues for the rest of the day, and it's for that reason that instead of going back to the dorms after class, James decides to go to the library. Maybe giving him some space will help. 
Besides, if he has to listen to Sirius sigh one more time, he's going to lose it. Marlene and Lily are already there, Remus having promised to be along later after grabbing some books from upstairs. James stews over his coursework, not really paying attention to anything he's reading, mind preoccupied with the Black Brothers. He wonders how Regulus is getting on. He didn't see him at breakfast, and Regulus was still asleep when James left this morning. He wasn't sure if he should wake him up or not, but decided against it. If anyone needs an extra hour or two of shot eye, it's Reg. Sirius is a whole other problem. It's clear that James can't keep shutting him out like this. Sirius won't stand for it, and even though he's being a complete wanker at the moment, James knows it's fair. Knows he'd probably be just as bad. But what other option does he have? Oi, add to Potter. Lily pulls him out of his thoughts. Damn, Urbans, we're in a library. Tone it down a bit. She blinks back at him, then elbows Marlene beside her. Ma, did you hear that? Marlene, who is still scribbling out her potions essay, nods. Sure did. Lily turns back to him, biting her lips to hold in a smile. I don't understand what's so funny here. He looks between the two girls, not at all in the mood for mind games. You just told me to tone it down. Uh, yeah. She's openly smiling now. You, James Potter, king of the loud, over-the-top wankers. Oi, okay, I'm not that bad. You just told me to tone it down. He gives her a flat look. You're enjoying this way too much, Evans. Pretty sure I'm enjoying it the exact right amount. <laughs> he shakes his head as he looks back down at his textbook. That must be some page, that. Lily is still smiling. He'd be more annoyed if it wasn't so fucking charming. <sighs> what are you on about now? She nods down at the page in front of him. Just that you've been reading that same section for the past 30 minutes. He blinks, looks down at the page, and then back up again. Maybe I'm just a very slow reader. Ever consider that? Please. I've seen you read a dozen times, James. He grins out of the corner of his mouth. You've been watching me, Evans. She rolls her eyes, but he's pleased to see pink stains on the tops of her cheeks. We've been in school together for five years. I've seen you read. A likely story. So, what is it that's got you so preoccupied you can't get through a single paragraph? He meets her green eyes across the table and thinks, not for the first time, that this lying business is really rather exhausting and he has no idea how the Slytherins manage it. I don't know. He runs a hand through his hair. She sends him a pointed look that makes clear that that will not be enough for her, so he decides to give in a little. Sirius is upset with me. Oh no. Trouble in paradise. Yeah, a bit. She leans forward across the table, expression becoming slightly more sincere. Did you have a fight? And how does he even answer that? Well then, maybe I can't tell. She arches her brow. I'm sorry, you can't tell. <laughs> Boys. Hey, it's complicated, okay? Somehow I doubt that. Marlene doesn't even bother to look up from her coursework. Ma, stop antagonizing him. Lily elbows her again, holding back a smirk. Go on, Potter. You don't know if you and your best mate have had a fight. Well, we did have a fight. But we were fine afterwards. You made up? What? No. We just pretended it never happened. She blinks slowly. Ah. I see. You were... She makes air quotes with her fingers. Fine. Honestly, you lot are way less sympathetic than I thought you would be. James crosses his arms over his chest and slouches in his seat. Sorry. Sorry. She shakes out her shoulders. Sympathetic Lily. In the house. So, you ignored all your feelings, dealt with nothing, and now it's coming back to bite you in the arse. James glares at her across the table. That didn't sound very sympathetic. Didn't it? James continues to pout. <sighs> Listen. Here's what it comes down to. Did you do something wrong? James's stomach squirms. Yeah. So, apologize. Oh, brilliant advice, that. Well? She looks at him expectantly. Have you tried it? No. You might want to. <sighs> he runs a hand over his face. It's not that simple. 
He doesn't want an apology. He wants me to, to fix it. Which is as close to the truth as James is going to get. Lily looks at him, eyes searching his face for a moment. And you can't? Don't want to? <sighs> I'm scared, more like. Okay, that's as close to the truth as James is going to get. She nods slowly. Well, have you tried telling him that? He opens his mouth, finds he has nothing to say, and closes it again. That hadn't actually occurred to him. After a few moments of watching him flounder, Lily leans forward again, placing her hands on his arm, which feels weird. Nice, but weird. Listen, I'm not saying I'm an expert or anything, but I'm pretty sure even the giant squid knows how much Sirius Black loves you. So, whatever you did, I bet you anything that he wants to forgive you more than he wants to be angry with you. Besides, she pulls back. It's a bit sad, one of you without the other. You're really better as a pair. <laughs> I'm going to try not to take that as an insult. Good. It wasn't meant as one. He nods, scrubbing at his face before meeting her gaze again. You're right. I know you are. I'm bloody miserable without the wanker. She smiles, a little more softly than he would have expected. What? Nothing. She shakes her head, still smiling. Just. It's sweet as all. James pulls a face. <laughs> I'm just saying. How annoying you lot are. Minus Remus, of course. Of course. I've always said Remus is my best quality. She smirks. However annoying. The way you look after each other. It's always been... I don't know. The most human thing about you. Human? You thought I was... Inhuman? Sometimes. There are a few years there where you felt more like a cartoon character than a person. All those bloody proposals. James grimaces. Mm. Oh yeah. Those. Mm. Those. He rubs the back of his neck, fidgeting uncomfortably. Suppose I owe you an apology for some of them. She arches her brow. Are you sure you don't want to just act like they never happened? <laughs> As if any of us could ever forget. James glares at her, even though she's not looking up to see it. Thanks, Ma. Big help you are. Anytime, Potter. <sighs> James turns back to Lily, who watches him expectantly. Well, for what it's worth, I am sorry. About most of them. Most? Well, not the first one. She arches her brow. But the rest of them? He shrugs. Kind of became expected, didn't it? Couldn't let my audience down. He sees the familiar expression of anger pinching her face. And what about me then? James ducks his head sheepishly. Yeah, I know, it wasn't. wasn't fair. You got lost a bit, ironically, in the show of it. It just. it took me a while to figure that out. That I'd stop doing it for you. Stop thinking about you at all, really. He expects her to get angry, but she doesn't. Just watches him. He feels uncomfortable, but he does his best to bear it. To let her get out whatever it is that she needs to. If not yelling, he at least expects a dressing down. Lily is rather famously good at those. But the next words out of her mouth are not what he expects. But... The first one... Y you thought about me then? Yeah, you were all I thought about, really. He doesn't know why that feels important, but it does. There's a moment of silence then, both of them looking at each other for the first time with the past laid out in front of them. Eventually James can't take it anymore. Well, better get back to- He gestures to the book in front of him. Right. Lily seems to shake herself awake. Right. Yeah. He tries to concentrate, really, but he never does get past that page. James is not new to detention. In fact, he's rather old hat at it. Usually it involves cleaning. On occasion, when McGonagall is feeling particularly spiteful, it also includes essay writing. Something about making him think about his actions and consider the consequences, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, all things considered, dusting and polishing old trophies is one of the better options. So James is feeling in relatively good spirits as he strolls up to the dusty room in the east wing of the dungeons. That is, until he remembers who he's gotten himself in trouble with. 
No, oh, fuck. Snape skulks down the corridor towards them. James turns to the caretaker. I would rather you hang me from the ceiling by my toes than spend the next three hours with that tosser. Filch seems almost wistful. If only, my boy, if only. Um, James doesn't no, think that is strictly true. Lines, uh, he follows Filch into the room very pointedly, not talk. looking at Snape who has come anyone. up behind him. Yeah. The door has barely closed before James has a rag and spray bottle thrown in his face. He decides to let it go, however, because Filch does the same thing to Snape, who makes a ridiculous noise that makes James laugh. You! Filch points at James. Start at that end. And you! That one. He gestures to the opposite end of the long, slender room, which is made up almost entirely of shelves. What all these trophies are for, James hasn't the foggiest. He's done this once or twice before. A lot of them are Quidditch. Some are for academics or sports that James has never heard of and clearly went out of fashion centuries ago. Some are inscribed in Latin, so honestly, it's anyone's guess. Wands. Filch holds out his hand. Wands. James just rolls his eyes, pulling his out of his pocket and handing it over. There's no magic allowed in detention. Filch leers, motioning to Snape with his fingers. Now. Hand it over. Snape scowls back at the man, seemingly trying to decide whether or not he actually has to listen to him. James doesn't think that is strictly true. He follows Filch into the room very pointedly, not looking at Snape, who has come up behind you him. Do you want me to be fetching McGonagall? Telling her you aren't complying? Hmm? If anything, Snape's scowl seems to deepen. She's not my head of house. Didn't say she was. Filch looks over at James suspiciously. There's no getting on the caretaker's good side. There's only staying off his bad side. And James has always managed that balancing act rather well. Eventually, Snape hands over his wand. All right, then, you lot get to work. I'll be back in an hour to check on your progress. You're just going to leave us? Don't worry. <laughs> You needn't be afraid. Mrs. Norris will be here to watch you. Won't you, sweetheart? The feline emerges from between a stack of trophies on the floor, winding her way around the caretaker's legs. James does his best to repress a shiver. He's always hated that cat. Now, if you want to get out of here before midnight, I'd suggest you start polishing. James kicks himself upright. Happy to put some distance between himself and Snape as he walks down to the other end of the room. He polishes a few trophies the muggle way, keeping an eye on Mrs. Norris in the back of Snape's head. But once he's certain that neither of them can see him, he slides Peter's wand out of his sleeve. This isn't James's first go around, and he absolutely refuses to be stuck in this miserable room all night. With a quick flick of the wand, the trophies closer to him start to sparkle, and James smiles. My, my, Mr. Potter, aren't you quick? Filch comes back an hour later, when James has nearly half the room done without breaking a sweat. Lots of practice, sir. He smiles. Filch does not smile back, his sneering gaze moving over to Snape, whose normally grey face is flushed and sweaty and made even uglier by the intense anger James can see bubbling beneath it. You, on the other hand... Filch looks at Snape's pitiful pile of polished trophies. James reckons he could do twice that many, even if he wasn't cheating. Pick up the pace, boy. I'll be back again in an hour, and I expect you to have more done than that. There is little that bothers Filch quite as much as poor housekeeping. He gives Mrs. Norris a scratch on the head before trudging out of the room. James turns back to the shelves behind him. Unfortunately... Now that he's no longer hidden away in his corner, he'll have to start doing them by hand. Still, he's managed to make an impressive dent if he does say so himself. How the hell did you get through those so fast? <sighs> James is now, unfortunately, much closer to his detention partner. Listen, Snivellus. He looks over at Snape, whose rag is curled in his fist as though it has personally offended him. It's not my fault that you're crap at everything. Ah! <laughs> 
James bends down to pick up his next trophy. Prefect of the year is scrawled across it, and James has half a mind to nick it for Remus. Never would have pegged you for a queer potter. James feels himself pause. It's the first time anyone's ever called him that, and he expected to feel... more about the disgust in Snape's tone. But maybe it's because it's Snape, pathetic and grasping as he is, that makes it almost laughable instead. He looks over at the other boy, expression flat. Sorry, did you say something? You have to speak up, I'm not fluent in arsehole. Tell me, Potter, does your friend know you're fucking his brother? Do you know that I'm fucking his brother? James feels the weight of Peter's wand up his sleeve and struggles to find the willpower not to use it. Because I don't actually think you do. That's just the baseless conclusion that you've drawn in that tiny little brain of yours. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to polishing so that I can get the hell out of here. Snape opens his mouth to speak, but- Great! Glad we're on the same page. He very purposefully turns away from him, scrubbing rather unfairly at the trophy in his hands. A few moments of silence pass and James starts to think that he might actually be able to get through the rest of this night without having to speak to Snape again. Of course, Snape has other plans. That's the second time you've come to his rescue. Good to know you can count. Bit hypocritical of you, don't you think? James hates that he can feel himself taking the bait, responding to the infuriatingly smug tone Snape's voice has taken on. Whatever are you talking about, Severus? James Potter, defender of half-bloods and muggle-borns, protecting Regulus Black. Hardly adds up, does it? Shockingly, I don't really care what you think adds up. I bet I'm not the only one who would have a problem with it, even if you aren't fucking him. James very determinedly picks up another trophy, hoping Snape doesn't notice the way his hands shake with the barely refrained desire to punch him in his stupid mouth. People like Lily, for example. As someone who quite enjoys antagonizing people, James can recognize a trap when he sees one. And this one is oh so transparent. Unfortunately, that doesn't stop him from walking right into it. You just can't help yourself, can you? Says the voice in his head that sounds strangely like his mother. Oh, because you know Lily so well. I do. <laughs> really? Because from what I hear, you two aren't so close anymore. And I don't know if you've noticed Snivellus, but now at meals, she eats with me. Snape's mouth forms a firm line, and James is about to confidently turn back to his cleaning when- Did he tell you why we were fighting? That makes James pause, because of course he didn't which isn't unusual for Regulus. For every word he says, James knows there are a dozen he doesn't. Still, he can't quite bring himself to admit that to Snape, who seems to understand it anyway, smiling again. He called her a mudblood. At first, James doesn't quite understand it. Can't take it in. What? He doesn't want to play this game anymore. See? Hypocrite. James throws the trophy in his hand to the side, causing it to crash into the pile behind him. Let me get this straight. He just walked up to you in the middle of the night and went, Oh, hey Severus, you know that Lily Evans, she's a... I'm supposed to believe that. Snape is clearly enjoying this. No, there was a bit more to it than that, though I don't think you'd have liked any of the rest of it much better. A lot of boasting about his family and blood status. If memory serves, you've done worse than shove people into walls for that kind of thing. James has a rotting feeling growing in the pit of his stomach. Because Snape is right. God, does he hate it. And you were, what? Standing up for muggle wizard equality. Snape runs him up and down with his beady little eyes. Well, you certainly weren't. No, fuck you. He wants to be able to say that he can't picture it. But the terrible truth is he thinks that Reg might. Might say those things. If he was pushed. If he was angry. The rotting feeling grows. So which is it, Potter? Which side are you on? Well, I'm sure as fuck not on yours. Snape's black eyes glint viciously in the candlelight. Are you sure about that? Because I can promise you that Regular certainly is. James is already in the come-and-go room when Regulus gets there. 
He came right from detention. He sits at the end of the bed, elbows on his knees, hands clasped between them. He doesn't look up when Regulus comes in. He doesn't quite know how to handle himself. Oh. He hears Regulus stop. You're... early? You're... He doesn't want to be angry with Regulus. He doesn't want to believe Snape. He decides that if Regulus denies it, he'll let it go. He'll trust him. Because he does, doesn't he? Trust him? James? Regulus is still standing by the door. And James knows he's let the silence stretch on too long. With a sigh, he lifts his head, looking at Regulus and feeling the breath catch in his chest. I love you. I love you. I love you. He swallows with difficulty. Did you call Lily up? He usually avoids the word, but he doesn't want there to be any ambiguity here. Regulus blinks, surprised, and then nothing. Mask. Empty eyes stare back at him. He hates it. Yes. James feels something icy drip down his spine. Mud blood. Regulus looks back at him like he doesn't understand the question. Because she is one. What? Unless I'm mistaken, she- She's muggle-born. I'm sorry, I don't see the difference. You All he can do is gape at the boy in front of him. It's several moments before he seems to find himself again. You don't see the difference. When he gets no response, he runs a hand over his face. Reg, are you kidding me? They both mean the same thing. Bullshit. James sees the impact of his tone instantly. Sees Regulus's walls go up. Sees his eyes grow hard. That's bullshit, Regulus, and you know it. Once again, Regulus doesn't respond, standing there stiffly in the middle of the room. One of them is describing someone whose family doesn't have magic, and the other is attacking them. Those two things are not the same. Reg. He gets to his feet but doesn't move, just, just trying to get some sort of response. Is any of this getting through to you? He sees Regulus's jaw clench, sees the struggle going on in his grey eyes. He just wishes he knew what it was about. I understand your words. It's the sentiment I'm struggling with. The sentiment? He can see Regulus's frustration before he hears it. Though whether it's directed at James or himself, James can't tell. They don't have magic. They will never be us. Be what we can be. James opens and closes his mouth several times before he manages to get something out. So what? Regulus's eyes narrow. So what? What makes you think that we're the only thing worth being? Or even the best thing? Look at, look at this, Reg. He points up at the ceiling. You love this. This painting. This story. A wizard didn't come up with any of that. But when this room tried to give you the things you needed most, that's what it chose. Something muggle. Regulus has his eyes on the painting. It looks like he's concentrating, trying to puzzle something out. James knows that this is what he's like, that he goes quiet, that he needs to take his time with things. James has to be patient. But right now, it feels as though his anxiety is going to break through his skin. He'd never thought, really thought, that Reg believed any of this. He was trapped in that house. Trapped in Slytherin, but he wasn't... He wasn't one of them. Not really. Not his Reg. And right now, James just needs him to prove it. Needs it desperately. Because he can already feel the cracks in his heart and he isn't sure he can handle more. I never really thought of it like that. It's just always seemed magical to me. He shakes his head, eyes dropping back down. <sighs> that sounds stupid, I'm sure. No. James thinks of that awe and wonder that has nothing to do with spells. Who says wizards are the only ones with magic? Regulus looks away from James and then back again, like he can't quite hold his gaze. I don't know how to see the world the way you do. It's... No one's ever said anything like that to me. Or around me. If they had, my mother probably would have dismembered them. James isn't sure how much of that is a joke. But you still snuck out to those muggle museums. Regulus nods. I didn't really think of it at the time. I just... 
wanted to. That's enough, James thinks. We can work with that. Reg, I get it. I do. But you need to... You can't... You can't go using that word, okay? You can't go around calling people. Because if you do, then... I just need you to promise, okay? James is losing the threads of his thoughts. All the things he knows need to be said, but that he doesn't know how to say. Regulus nods again, warily. Okay. If that's what you want. Which isn't exactly the enthusiastic response James was looking for, but he'll take it. For now. Promise. I promise, James. Regulus's grey eyes are unwavering. And James trusts him. He trusts him. He trusts him. Doesn't he? He exhales a breath he wasn't aware he was holding, before extending his hand. A question. Regulus looks at it for a minute before walking forward, slotting his fingers between James's and allowing himself to be pulled in. Okay. James rests his chin on Regulus's head. Okay. The boy is warm and soft in his arms, and it makes James's bones ache. It frightens him, how much he feels about Regulus, and he finds himself wondering, for the first time, if maybe it's wrong. Dear James, I will try to refrain from nagging you too much about your horrendously sparse letters lately, but let me just remind you that I literally birthed you from my body, so you could perhaps put in a bit more effort, darling. I enclosed the jumper you asked for. It was curled in a heap under your bed, of course. Tell me, does Remus let you boys get away with such poor cleanliness in his room? Should I write him for tips? In any case, your father and I were both thrilled to hear about your win against Hufflepuff. He's thinking about coming down for your next match, so you'll have to let me know if that's an idea you'd like me to get out of his head. I know how very uncool having your parents doting on you can be. I should let you know, he has gotten his old school scarf and a Gryffindor jumper, yes, the one with the roaring lion on the front, ready to go just for the occasion. He's working quite a lot these days. I think he just wants something to look forward to. Not that I'm trying to guilt you into letting us come or anything. I too may have pulled my Gryffindor apparel from the basement, but that is purely a coincidence. Your cousin Daphne is having a baby. I can tell you're already pretending you don't know who she is, but I promise you you've been introduced to her on several occasions. I'll be heading to Diagon Alley to pick out a present, and I was thinking I'd get some new trainers for you and Sirius. You two are both looking ratty over Christmas, so you can be expecting those in the near future. You see, James Potter, this is a letter. Look at all those words. Don't you feel so much better informed now? I can feel our mother-son relationship strengthening with each sentence. Be warned, if you reply to me with four sentences or less, your father and I will be showing up to your Quidditch game in matching lion jumpers whether you want us to or not. Give my love to Sirius and the boys. Sincerely, your gracious, youthful, incredible mother. Mum, please, I'm begging you. Anything but the lion jumper. Anything. You can come, sure, but be a little... You can come, sure, but be a little more chill about it, okay? Like, maybe wear a trench coat, some hats, sunglasses. I'm just throwing out ideas here. Listen, it's not my fault my life is dull. I'm doing all right in classes. Frank has us practicing twice a day at this point, the tyrant. But that's hardly new. Mostly, everything is the same as it always is. Also, my room is not that messy. Me and Sirius are incredibly well-kept young gentlemen, I'll have you know. Well, I am, anyway. And Remus is not the boss of us. But please don't tell him I said that. Have they got Dad working on that Darkmark case? Is that why he's so busy? Bloody mad that was, how it just appeared like that in the middle of London. Do you know any more about what happened? Have they caught who did it? See, look, loads of words. Sincerely, the best son ever, James. A month after they get back from Christmas holidays, the image of a skull eating a snake is projected into the sky over downtown London. Clearly magical. Clearly in violation of just about every line of the Statue of Secrecy. The Auras have to obliviate a ton of muggles and spread a fake news story about how it was promotion for some film or something. No one knows where it came from, 
or what it means, and the ministry has been infuriatingly tight-lipped. Of course, there are rumors that it's connected to the Death Eaters, but they've never done anything like this before. Anything this big. Absolute bullshit. Sirius crumples up the Daily Prophet in his hands before incendio it. Oi, you're getting ash in my eggs. Peter tries to lean away. Nothing again. James doesn't bother to look up. What the hell are they playing at? How can they say nothing? How can they know nothing? It's been months at this point. I mean, don't we deserve some kind of, I don't know, fucking explanation? It's strange for James to see the differences between Sirius and Regulus. When they first heard about the mark, Sirius got loud and angry and reckless. There have been a lot of scuffles in the corridors. Not that James is in any position to criticize, he's been getting into a fair few fights of his own recently. But Reg? Reg got quiet. There were a few nights where they just lay next to each other, not touching, not talking. It should have been boring, frustrating, but it wasn't. It was nice to have him there, at James's side. Even if he couldn't explain to James what he was feeling, even if he needed to disappear for a bit. Things are better now, but the same way that Sirius's anger lingers just under his skin, so does Reg's silence. They're hiding something. Remus draws James's attention across the table. You think someone in the Ministry has something to do with it? James feels a bit uneasy about that, seeing as his dad is part of the Ministry. Remus just shrugs. I think they fucked up, and now they're trying to fix it before they have to admit to it. Well, they're doing a sheet job. How hard can it be to find them? I mean, they were casting in the middle of London. Someone had to have seen them. Maybe they have found them, and they just don't want to release their names to the public. No, they wouldn't do that. No way. I'm just saying, the Death Eaters have lots of sympathizers within the Ministry. What are you talking about? James doesn't know why this feels like a personal attack, but for some reason it does. The Minister of Magic has come out a dozen times renouncing them. He put more Dementors on Azkaban to make sure the prisoners were secure. The Ministry does not support these assholes. Remus looks up from his plate. <sighs> you know I'm not talking about your dad, right? Well, I don't know how you could not be. I'm just saying that I don't think we can trust everything the Ministry tells us. I'm with Mooney. James turns to Sirius with a look of betrayal on his face. I'm not talking about Fleamont, obviously. But my dad worked for the Ministry too. And my cousins as awful husbands are working there now. The way I reckon it, the good guys are outnumbered. James officially hates this conversation. His eyes skate over to the Slytherin table. They stand out starkly from the rest of the hall. He's not saying it's all of them. Not saying there aren't some Slytherins with tense faces and slouched shoulders. He's just saying it's a lot less than the rest of the school. <sighs> James pushes his plate away and gets to his feet. Where are you going? Class doesn't start for another half hour. James holds up the folded parchment in his hand. Gotta post a letter to my mum. I'll see you in charms. Yeah, alright. James pats him on the shoulder, giving Peter and Remus a nod before heading out of the hall and towards the Owlry. Things are okay between him and Sirius. He's at least talking to James again, which is something. But there's an undeniable stiffness to their conversations. It makes James's skin crawl. He keeps telling himself to follow Lily's advice and apologize, or admit that he's scared. Say something, anything. But months have passed and he still hasn't. Tomorrow, he keeps telling himself, I'll do it tomorrow. The one upside to this, if there is any, is that it seems to have forced Sirius and Remus to come to some sort of agreement. James isn't exactly sure what it is. He just knows that the weirder things get between him and Sirius, the easier they get with Sirius and Remus. He tries to think of it as a good thing. Tries not to be jealous. Not to hate Remus for it. So things are tense. Tense at school, tense outside of school. You can feel it when you walk down the halls, feel it in the whispered insults and rumors. Who cast the mark? Where are they? Why haven't they been caught? In the white faces of the first years, you can see the other fear. 
Are they coming for us? Honestly, James is sick of it. So maybe that's why. On his way back down from the Owlry, when he spots a head of short, black curls disappearing around the corner in front of him, he decides that charms is not at all what he wants to be doing with his morning. Luckily, the corridor Regulus turns down is empty, and James settles himself against the wall, watching the back in front of him for a minute before letting out a whistle. Regulus looks over his shoulder, sees James, does a double take, then slows to a stop and turns around. He stands there for a few moments, seemingly unable to decide whether to be surprised or annoyed. Can I help you, Potter? I bet you can. He nods towards the door beside him and sees Regulus recognise it for what it is. A broom cupboard, Potter. Really? How gauche of you. But he steps forward anyway, eyes darting around the hallway, checking that they're still alone. Broom cupboards are highly undervalued spaces, you know. Regulus arches his brow. Are they? Everyone always goes on and on about the towers, and the great hall, and the moving staircases. But when do they ever talk about the real backbone of this castle? The broom cupboards. He can see Regulus fighting off a smile and it makes something warm pool in James's stomach. He opens the door, gesturing with a dramatic bow for Regulus to enter. The broom cupboards. As soon as the door closes behind them, Regulus rounds on James, sending him a pointed look. You going to tell me what the hell this is about? Regulus's hair is still short, but it's grown enough that little curls have started to wisp around his ears and the back of his neck. James is a little obsessed with it, if he's being honest. James. James realises he's been staring. Sorry, you're very distracting. He grins out of the corner of his mouth and watches Regulus blush even as he rolls his eyes. Yeah, yeah. What do you want? I just realised what day it is, that's all. James is still grinning as he leans back against the door. Regulus looks at him flatly. It's Wednesday. Yes, it's the Wednesday I take you into the forest. Have you lost your mind? Jury's out on whether or not I had it to begin with. Come on, Reg, it'll be fun. Besides, I have something I want to show you. Oh, well, in that case... James, I have Transfiguration in 15 minutes. Ah, uh, but what if you didn't, though? Regulus is apparently so outraged by this statement that all he can manage in response is a series of indignant noises that James has to try very hard not to laugh at. After enduring a few seconds of silent glaring, James holds out his hand and, reluctantly, Regulus allows himself to be pulled forward, pressing into James, who bends down, nosing at the spot just behind Regulus's ear. James's lips brush his skin and he feels Regulus shiver. Come on, Reg. Break the rules for me. I'm already breaking the rules. So break them a little more. He kisses him gently, just under his jaw. You are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. James continues his light kisses, innocent, purposeless, trailing all along his neck. Merlin, fine. Fine. He's breathing heavily when he steps back, face fully red now, and James can't help but look smug. You're going to kill me one of these days. Regulus runs a hand over his short hair, trying to straighten himself out. Nah, never. What would I do without you? He sends him a smile that makes something flicker in Regulus's eyes. He has half a mind to ask him about it, but doesn't want to push his luck. You wait here. Wait here? In the broom cupboard? I'll go grab the invisibility cloak. It'll take me five minutes. James Potter, I'm not going to wait for you in a broom cupboard. Regulus does wait for him in a broom cupboard, even if he makes several angry comments about it under his breath after James gets back. With the cloak, it's incredibly easy to get out of the castle and past the Care for Magical Creatures class on the lawn outside. Spring is only just blooming, the weather still cold enough that you need a jacket or sweater. But the snow is gone, and today the sun is out, making it feel warmer than it is. James waits until they're sufficiently past the tree line before he takes the cloak off. I can't believe I let you convince me to do this. Regulus has his wand held in his hand like he's expecting to be attacked at any moment. Which is fair enough. There are a bunch of nasties in these trees. 
Luckily, James knows this place pretty well by now. Knows where to go and what not to step on. I've never skipped off class before. James smiles down at him, stepping over a fallen trunk. What? No, I'm shocked. Regulus shoves him into a nearby tree. <laughs> Merlin, keep your voice down before everything in here knows where we are. James rolls his eyes, pushing some bushes out of the way as he leads them on. Everything worth being afraid of already knows we're here. The branches are thick over the heads, causing the sunlight to drip down, lighting the way in tiny puddles. I'm sorry, what? Don't worry. They won't bother us as long as we don't bother them. Just stay out of their space. Their space? How do you know what their space is exactly? You follow me. Oh, because you're the Beast Whisperer, are you? I just happen to have excellent intuition. Also, maybe don't call them beasts. What? Just not very polite, is it? Regulus's <laughs> laugh is something James always wishes he could hold in his hand or slip in his back pocket and keep for later. You are an enigma. You know that. Me? You, Regulus Black, want to call me an enigma? Half the time you're this obnoxious Quidditch lad. I am not a lad. How am I lad? I don't act like a lad at all. Oh yes you do. Walking through the halls like you own the place. Like some bloody jock teen heartthrob. Oi! You're also a jock. I'm on the Quidditch team. He ducks below a low-hanging branch. But I'm not a jock. That makes no sense at all. Regulus only waves him off. You really should be such an airhead. And then, then, it's like you think about everyone. All the time. You care more than anyone I've ever met. It's... He shakes his head, at a loss for words. I get it, though. Why Sirius was drawn to you. Why he became so obsessed. James is unable to tell if Regulus is being sincere or just having a laugh. Sirius has never been obsessed with me. Yes, he has. He is. I used to hate it. Were you jealous? <laughs> of course I was jealous. You were cooler than me, and older than me, and I knew exactly what was going to happen. And what's that? I knew you were going to take him away. I don't think I took him away as much as you lot forced him out. Or oh, not you, but... His brain catches up with his mouth too late, and he realises what he's just said. Luckily, he's saved from having to explain himself as they break through the foliage and into the clearing on the other side. James is pretty sure he's going to be replaying this moment in his head for the next week. Sweet, huh? James looks out at the small waterfall in front of them. The water slips down the rocks and pools in a decent-sized pond at the bottom. The green vines snaking along the stones only just starting to bud with little pink flowers. He found it last year, during one of the full moons, and he's been back with Sirius a few times since. It's beautiful. Without the trees over their heads, the sun pours down uninterrupted, making the water sparkle. James nods, knocking his shoulder against Regulus's before stepping forward and starting to unbutton his shirt. Um, excuse me, what are you doing? Going swimming, obviously. He shoots Regulus a grin as he slides the shirt off his shoulders. Swimming? You can't go swimming in there, James. Are you completely insane? And why not? Well, for starters, it's going to be freezing. Ah, good point. James pulls out his wand casting a warming charm over the water before bending down to check the temperature with his fingers. Perfect. He winks at Regulus over his shoulder, the younger boy looking scandalised. Did you just... did you just warm the whole pond? Mm-hmm. James straightens up, dropping his wand onto the pile with his shirt and glasses. That's... that's a complicated variation on that spell. Is it? James slips out of his trousers and stands in front of Regulus in his pants. Well, come on. Wait! James! Salazar, you absolute madman! You can't just go jumping into a random body of water in this forest of all places! James has to bite down on his lower lip to keep from laughing. You have no idea what could be in there! He does, actually, having been in several times. First as a stag, of course. Always safer that way. Reckon we might run into some mermaids. That would not be nearly as fun as you seem to think it would be. <laughs> well... Only one way to find out. No. 
there is definitely more than one way to find out. Come on, Reg. He stands at the edge of the shore, back to the water. What's life without a little risk? Safe. <laughs> James falls backwards into the water. It's deceptively deep, and he flips himself around so he can dive further down before coming back up for air. James Potter, I swear to Merlin, if whatever is in that water doesn't kill you, I will. James breaks the surface. Reg is on his hands and knees at the water's edge, a stern look on his face. James shakes out his hair, swimming back over. Seems a bit contradictory, don't you think? Mm. James secretly loves that noise. Reg, it's safe. I promise. Regulus searches his face for a moment. You've done this before? About a dozen times. What kind of person wanders into a deadly forest just to have an afternoon swim? James only rolls his eyes, diving back below the surface. The water is so clear that he's almost certain this whole place has been magicked by the founders or someone who came after. Everything about it is so idyllic. So juxtaposed to the breast of the dark, overgrown forest. He comes back to the surface and finds Regulus on his feet again. Shoes and socks off, shirt halfway undone. There we go. James smiles, spitting water out of his mouth. Regulus sends him a dry look. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can. It's brilliant. The younger boy shimmies out of his shirt and James feels something tug hard on his gut. He'd forgotten that he'd never seen Regulus anything but fully dressed before, and he hadn't quite prepared himself for what it would feel like, which apparently is overwhelming. Shirtless Regulus, James realises, is a special kind of weakness for him. You're sure there's nothing in there that's going to eat me? Regulus does away with his trousers and comes to stand at the edge of the water. James? What? Sorry? No sea monsters, we? Oui? James blinks. Was that French? Did you just speak French to me? He's not sure his heart can handle this. Regulus blushes. Sorry, it just slipped out. <laughs> Do not apologise. Say something else. What? In French. Say something else. James is treading water, shoulders bobbing in and out of the pond, and he's glad to have an excuse for the breathless sound of his voice. For a moment, he doesn't think Reg is going to do it. He just stands there watching him. J'ai peur de te blesser parce que je t'aime. Je pense que je le ferai toujours. Hmm. What did you say? Regulus blinks before looking away. I said your hair looks ridiculous. Did not. Are you suddenly fluent in French, Potter? Oh, please. He rolls his eyes. Don't start with Potter again. Makes me feel like I'm in detention or something. <laughs> A familiar feeling for you, I'm sure. Oh, ha ha ha. Now, get in here before I drag you in. <laughs> you wouldn't. But before he can finish, he gets a face full of water as James splashes what seems like nearly half the pond on him. You. Are. Five. Regulus wipes the water from his <laughs> face. <laughs> Big words from the man still standing on the shore. James starts to swim further out, but stays on his back so that he doesn't break eye contact with Regulus. Come on, Black. Come and get me. He sees the light flash in Regulus's eyes. You're mine, Potter. <laughs> James turns to swim away properly as he hears Regulus hit the water. Yes, he thinks, cutting across the pond. Yes, I am. A while later, they're lying on their backs in the sun, Regulus dressed again, James still in just his pants, both with their eyes closed, enjoying the warmth. We'll have to go back eventually. I can't skip out on the whole day. <sighs> oh, why are you? School is so miserable. Here is so nice. Yeah, nice until something eats us. <laughs> Nothing is going to eat us. If you say so. James cracks his eyes open turning his head to look at Regulus. It really is a bit ridiculous, how much he enjoys it. Just watching him. How he could do it all day. The skin is flushed from the sun, curls slightly tighter after the water. James wants to run his hand through them, but he's pretty sure Reg doesn't want to be touched right now. He's gotten good at picking up on his moods, on the way they shift. There are good days and bad days, sure, but there are also good moments and bad moments. It changes 
even within the time they spend together. James understands that, even if he doesn't know why. You're staring. Regulus's eyes aren't open. James smiles. You're beautiful. <laughs> I don't know why you say that. I don't know why you don't believe it. He sees Regulus tense and then force himself to relax. I've never heard it before. Which James thinks is a travesty. Well, you are. Hey, Reg, hmm? have you... have you done this? He motions between the two of them. Before? He feels the stillness as much as he sees it, watching Regulus's Adam's apple bob up and down as he swallows. Yes. James thinks that, deep down, he already knew that, but still he finds himself surprised by it. Was it important? He watches lines appear on Regulus's face as he squeezes his eyes more tightly closed. I guess that would depend on your idea of important. James accepts this, resisting the urge to reach out and smooth the wrinkles from his face. They never told you you were beautiful. <laughs> Reg. No. I... They didn't see me that way. Most people don't see me the way you see me. Je ne les mérite pas. James feels his chest grow tight at the tone of Regulus's voice, rolling towards him and onto his side. It's not the way I see you. It's just the way you are. Regulus brings his hands up to cover his face. You can't say things like that to me. Why? Because they hurt. They aren't supposed to. Regulus nods, dropping his hands to look at James again. I know. Oh, that look. That look breaks his heart. I'm sorry. Don't be. He reaches out and runs his hand through James's wet hair. James closes his eyes, falling into the touch. I just wish... I... I just wish this was easier. There is a delicacy to this confession. A vulnerability that James knows Regulus hates. His hand pauses, thumb rubbing gentle circles into James's temple. I don't think important things are supposed to be easy. He opens his eyes to find that Regulus has rolled onto his side as well. You're important, Reg. You're so fucking important. Especially to me. Regulus's eyes widen. I'm stilling. Je ne t'aimerais pas. What does that mean? There's a fragile space that has been built up around them. Regulus looks back at him. Grey eyes full of so much feeling they nearly swallow James whole. Eventually he exhales, propping himself up on his elbow and leaning down to press a chaste kiss to James's mouth. You can taste the water, the sunlight, the sadness. Regulus pulls back, still leaning over him. I said your hair looks ridiculous. <laughs> I don't believe you. He turns his head kissing the palm of the hand that's still holding him. Regulus smiles sadly. Good. They head back to the castle for lunch. James makes several attempts to dry his hair with little success. Domestic spells have never been his strong suit, but even Regulus can't seem to get it to work. There's just so much of it. Whatever. If anyone asks, I'll just tell them I took a shower or something. Do people often ask you about your hair? Obviously. He makes a show of primping it. It's got quite the fan club. I'm sure it does. They part in an empty corridor, James whipping off the cloak and Regulus instantly pulling away. I'll see you later, yeah? Yeah. James makes a run back to Gryffindor Tower to drop off the cloak and grab his books. He tries to do something with his hair again, but it's no use. You're bloody ridiculous. He gives up and heads for the Great Hall. He's about two corridors away when he spots his friends chatting against the wall outside of class. He's in such a good mood that he forgets that he ditched them without any warning this morning, that he went to the Owry and never came back, forgets that they will almost certainly demand an explanation. He blames the sun, blames Regulus's mouth. They've made his brain go fuzzy. James? Peter is the first one to see him, causing the other two to swivel towards him. James smiles, until he sees the expression on Sirius's face. Uh oh, he thinks. Oh shit. That was some trip to the Alry. Um, is your hair wet? 
Remus squints at him. Yeah, I, I took a shower. Where? What? Where did you take a shower? Because it wasn't in our room, we checked. James opens and closes his mouth several times, but can't quite make any words come out. What? Nothing. Serious. James appreciates Remus's effort, but they both know it's a lost cause. You taking your walks in the middle of the bloody day now? Damn, Jamie, it's a miracle you can stand with all the bloody walking you do. Serious, I- No, fuck you. I'm so tired of your bullshit. I mean, you can't even be bothered to come up with a decent lie for fuck's sake. You couldn't care less about us if you tried. Okay, that's not fair. Yeah, whatever. I'm done with this. Sirius makes to walk away, but James grabs his arm and then, in a split-second decision, starts dragging him towards the empty classroom next to them. Oi! Sirius doesn't really put up much of a fight, though. James. Remus steps forward, eyes travelling nervously between the pair of them, clearly unsure of whether or not he should step in. Me and Paz need to have a talk. We'll meet you guys in the Great Hall, yeah? Remus still hesitates, hovering in the doorway as James shoves Sirius inside. Mooney, I'm not going to fight him, I promise. I just want to talk. I might fight him! Remus raises his eyebrow, but James waves his concerns away. If he really wants to throw a punch, I can take it. Well, that's comforting. He looks between them one more time before shaking his head. Come on, Pete, let's go. He disappears back into the corridor, the door closing behind him. James gears himself up for whatever the hell is coming next because, to be honest, he doesn't really have a plan. Sirius glares at him. So, are we going to discuss your favourite route? Sirius. The sights you see along the way? I hear the grounds are great for bird watching. Maybe that's what you've been doing with your time. Sirius. Of course, probably not the best time for bird watching, the middle of the night and all. Stargazing, then. Shall we discuss our favourite constellations? Mine, personally, is Alpha Canis Maturis, but you can see why I might be slightly biased. I've been seeing someone. Sirius shuts his mouth, the tirade of words coming to an end, leaving them just standing there, staring at one another. The silence feels deafening. Yeah. No shit. James doesn't exactly know what to say to that. You've been lying about it for months. Poorly, sure, but still lying. To me. Yeah. James refrains from pointing out that Sirius has also been lying. Or at the very least, neglecting to mention that he snogged one of their best mates. He can't quite see that accusation going over well right now. Sirius stares at him expectantly, clearly waiting for some kind of explanation. It's a bloke. Sirius blinks, his entire body going rigid. It's such a sudden change that James can spot it even from across the room. What? The person I've been seeing. He's a boy. He doesn't want anyone to know. That's why I didn't tell you. I'm sorry, really. James knows if he takes his time, he won't get it out. That the words will get stuck in his throat. It's not the whole truth. He knows that, but it's as close as he can get right now. The silence is stretching on too long, and James can feel himself growing anxious. He hopes that this wasn't a mistake. He wanted to make things better. He wanted to get rid of the wall that's been slowly building itself between him and Sirius these past few months. He wanted his friend back. You didn't tell me because he asked you not to. Or you didn't tell me because you were afraid of how I'd react. James passes a hand over his face and meets Sirius's eyes. Does it matter? Yes. To me. It matters. He's not sure what the right answer is here. If there is a right answer. Both. It was both. He can't read the expression on Sirius's face has no idea what he's feeling. James just wants him to tell him it's okay. That they're okay. He opens his mouth to say as much when Sirius suddenly starts forward. He's leaving, James thinks, feeling his heart clench. Fuck. Fuck. But then Sirius wraps his arms around him, pulling him close, and in his shock, it takes James a few minutes to respond, to hold him back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for whatever I did that made you think you couldn't tell me. James doesn't think he's ever been so relieved in his life. A shaking breath escaping his lungs as he drops his head against his friend's shoulder. God, I'm so glad that- You're you... my brother, James. My family, there's nothing- Sirius pulls back so that they can look at each other. There's nothing bigger than that, okay? Not ever. James feels a little ridiculous getting choked up over this. But he'd been so worried. Do I feel the same? Uh, obviously. Now who's gone soft, eh? Sirius grins and James shoves him. It feels good. It feels like he can breathe again. He still doesn't know it's regulus. But James pushes that thought away, not willing to deal with it right now. Sirius's expression is sincere again. Listen, I, I need to... There's something I need to tell... Oh!
What the hell was that? Sirius looks around like he's expecting to find the headmaster standing behind him. James shakes his head, hands dropping away from his ears. No idea. Never heard him do that before. Oi! You reckon they caught the people who put up the mark? You think they'd call a school assembly for that? Usually they make us wait to get the news from the Prophet like everyone else. Yeah, but these are extreme circumstances. And while James is still skeptical, he can't say that Sirius doesn't have a point. Merlin, who knows? Maybe. I hope they did. Can't wait to see those bastards crumble in front of the Wizengamot. They push their way outside. The halls are a mess. Confused students looking around, making their way uncertainly towards the Great Hall. You think they will? Of course. You know they're all slithering, big and bad, until McGonagall has them in his sights, and then it's all... Please, Professor. I didn't mean it, Professor. Please don't be mean to me, Professor. Sounds like you're doing an impression of Peter. <laughs> You can't tell him I said that. Oh, <laughs> I'm definitely going to. Come on, you know he's going to- Dear James, serious. James looks ahead to see Remus waving at them through the chaos that is the Great Hall. James waves back, grabbing hold of Sirius and dragging him through the sea of students to where their friends are sitting at the brick and mortar table. Any idea what's going on? They sit down. Remus shakes his head. Not a clue. We just got here and the food disappeared. Peter looks mournfully at the empty table. Hey, you two look it out. He nods to Sirius, whose eyes are trained on the professors at the head table. Uh, yeah. James gives him a smile. Yeah, we worked it out. Good. Everyone, All heads snap towards the front of the room where Dumbledore stands at the podium, wand pointed at his throat. The reaction is instant. Couldn't have been faster if it had been enforced by magic. James looks over at the Slytherin table, but he can't spot Regulus amongst the crowd of green and silver. Better. Dumbledore smiles kindly, lowering his wand. Behind him, all the teachers are assembled, but none of them are sitting, which feels a bit ominous if James is being honest. Now, as I am sure you are all aware, a few months ago, a mark was cast over London. One that has been associated with a group of witches and wizards who call themselves Death Eaters. He runs his eyes over the body of students before him. James isn't sure he's ever heard the Great Hall so quiet. Everything is still. It feels like even the enchanted sky above them has frozen. It is now believed that this was a warning, foreshadowing an attack that took place today in Diagon Alley. James feels the air rush out of his lungs frightened whispers building up around him. Dumbledore raises his hand, and without even having to say a word, all mouths shut. As of right now, thirteen people have been pronounced dead. Five are in critical care at St. Mungo. Thirteen? That's... that's never happened before, has it? He looks at James as if he knows. There's never been that many. It is believed that the victims were specifically targeted. We do not, at this time, have confirmation on the names of the victims. But classes have been cancelled for the rest of the afternoon, and students will be summoned one at a time by their heads of house to contact their families. He gives them another sweeping look. In this hour of tragedy, our friends are our greatest resource. Our strength. Be there for one another. And we will make it through this. Thank you. You're dismissed. There's shuffling. Feet on the floor. Benches being pushed back from the table. But James can't move. An icy sensation dripping down his bones. James? He barely registers Remus's voice. His name floating past him, unable to permeate the new bubble of panic slowly surrounding him. Hey, Prongs. Sirius's hand comes down, warm and steadying on his shoulder, and James blinks up at him. What is it? My mum. She said... She said she was going to die, Gunnelly. They end up outside on the lawn. James grabs his snitch. Something to do. Something to keep his hands busy. 
He wanted to fly, but Flitwick saw him with his broom and quickly put a stop to that plan. Apparently, all students are to remain on the ground for the foreseeable future. He begged McGonagall to let him flee his parents. Alphabetical order, Potter. She's already sweeping past him with the first student. I'm sorry. So here he is, sitting with his friends on the lawn, throwing a snitch up and down and trying not to think about the fact his mum might be. Well, there are other students around, though most groups are like them. Tense. Quiet. It feels weird. Their fear out of place under the sun. The world does not look tragic, and somehow that makes it all the more unnerving. Remus lets out a sharp hissing noise, and James looks down in time to catch him grimacing at his potions textbook. You okay, Mooney? Yeah. Sorry. Don't apologise. You need me to grab you a pain potion? Sirius props himself up on his elbows, but Remus shakes his head again. No. It's not so bad this month. The full moon is tomorrow. James had almost forgotten. He runs his friend over one more time, pale purple bags under his eyes, shivering slightly. You let us know if you want to go back up to the room, okay? James doesn't think he could stand sitting in that quiet, but he offers anyway. At least out here there are things to distract himself with. At least out here he doesn't feel trapped. Thanks. But I'm fine, really. Remus has already been called up to McGonagall's office. His mother was there, his father at work, both fine. It's good. Remus doesn't need any more tragedy in his life. James tries not to let the other thoughts in. The ones that say that that makes it just a little bit more likely that his mum is one of the victims. Lyle Lupin would make sense as a target. He's already been one once, after all. James hates himself for thinking that. Hates himself for wanting, even for a second. This time, when he catches the snitch, his hand wraps around it a little more tightly. Just not my mum, he thinks over and over again. Not my mum. Anyone but my mum. Which, again, is a shitty thing to want. Especially as he looks at the other kids around him. There aren't that many wizards and witches in the world. Really, there aren't. That thirteen were killed today. Thirteen. Just not my mum. Please, not my mum. Anyone but my mum. He can't remember the last time he told her he loved her. He thinks of the pitiful letters he's been sending home, once every three weeks at most, barely a paragraph long. How could he be so callous? He loves his dad, really he does, but his home is his mum. Without her, without her he... James? His head snaps up at the feel of Sirius's hand on his arm. James tries to breathe. She's going to be okay. His eyes demand James stay still, just for a moment. The man to hear was being said to him. Prompt. And he wants to tell him that he can't. Can't possibly promise that. Except that the brilliant thing about Sirius Black, his best mate, is that he makes you believe that he can. James nods stiffly. Thanks. Of course. James looks up and sees Snape and Mulciber coming out of the castle and they're fucking laughing. He sees Regulus pushed against a wall. Sees him struggling to breathe. See Snape looming over him, not giving a shit. It happens so fast. Like a switch has been flicked in his brain and suddenly all his fear and regret and pain turns to anger. It hits him so hard he shakes with it. He's on his feet before he can think about what he's doing. Someone calls his name, Remus he thinks, but he doesn't turn away. His wand is already out by the time Snape sees him coming. He doesn't care that they're in the open, surrounded by people, that he will definitely be punished for this. Good, he thinks. Let them watch. Levy Corpus. James's spell drags Snape up into the air by his ankles. He sees Mulsiver raise his wand, but it's knocked out of his hand in the same moment as Sirius comes up beside him. Thanks, Pads. Anytime, Prongs. What the fuck, Potter? Snape's voice is loud in the somber afternoon. There is something dangerous in the air. Something that snaps and crackles and threatens to ignite. And James is glad for it. Because someone might have hurt his mum, and that makes him want to burn the world to the ground. Hey, Pads. He fully intends to make a show of this. What colour do you reckon Snivellus's pants are? Ugh, prone. You're gonna make me sick up my lunch. Honestly, this feels good. The two of them doing what they do best. James feels a nasty smirk curling his lips. 
You think he washes them as much as he washes his hair? You may never. Fuck you! Snape is struggling, though James can't imagine why. It's his spell. He ought to know better than anyone that there's no way he's getting down until James puts him down. Wanna bet on it? I say they're green. My money's on grey. Oh, or brown. The, the creep has no style. Do you want to do the honor? What the hell are you doing? James feels it against his skin. The anger in her voice that hasn't been directed at him in a long time. Ah, Evans. Here to see the show. She comes up beside him, but he doesn't take his eyes off Snape. Doesn't want to look at her face. James. James, I know you're worried. But this... I thought you were trying to be better than this. And that irks him. Maybe because it's true. Maybe because she's still defending Snape. Even now. Even after everything that's happened today and everything that she knows that he is. He's one of them. You don't know that. Sure I do. You can't punish him just because you feel bad. It won't change anything. It'll just make it worse. And, uh, oh, that's just bang out of order. Because that isn't what he's doing. He isn't making this up just to, to feel better. I thought you were done with him, huh? You told me that. You said it. You don't like him anymore. Was that all talk, Lily? Just bullshit? No. But none of that makes what you're doing okay. Oh, and who made you the moral authority? What makes you so good? This is ridiculous. Put him down. No. And this time James does look at her. Looks her dead in the eye. Now shut up, or go away. Just not my mum. Please not my mum. Anyone but my mum. Sirius. He turns back to Snape. Take off his trousers. And to his credit, Sirius doesn't hesitate. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Black. Unless you want your friend to get stupefied at close range. James almost laughs, looking over at her raised wand. You can hex me, Evans. She doesn't even blink. Absolutely. Now put him down. He holds her gaze, unwavering green eyes boring into his. Part of him wants to push her, to see if she really means it. But then, one look at her is all he needs to know that she does. Well, Snivellus, aren't you lucky? The pretty girl came to your rescue. There's a smile on his face that feels sharp. Ever the gentleman, always letting a woman fight your battles for he you. He watches Snape's face contort with rage and embarrassment, and he thinks that this might actually be better than taking his trousers off. I don't need a filthy mudblood to defend me. He's not even entirely certain what happens next. Everything goes a bit hazy. He knows he drops his wand, and Snape along with it, and then he's on top of him, driving his fist into his ugly face. He's not thinking, not really. It's all feeling, pouring out of him and into Snape's bleeding mouth. The violence feels good. All that anxiety and fear finally finding the outlet it's been craving. For a moment he can't remember why he ever wanted to be better than this. And then he's thrown back. Magic. He lands on his back a few paces away, the air knocked from his lungs. He sits up, trying to get on his feet again, but finds a wand in his face. Don't. You heard what he said, what he called you. But Lily only shakes her head. Don't you dare use me as an excuse, James Potter. That catches his attention, and suddenly he can see the wetness in her eyes. Don't you fucking dare. She waits a moment longer before sliding a wand back up her sleeve and turning away. James sees Mary and Marlene hovering in the background, concerned looks on their faces as she walks right by them. Snape, of course, is gone. James suddenly feels exhausted. Christ prongs, are you alright? Sirius comes up beside him and James lets out a breath that might be a laugh, bringing his hands up to his face, waiting a minute. He tries to think of this morning, to remember how it had felt to hear Regulus laugh, to see him smiling in the sun, the warmth of his hands, his mouth. And suddenly he wants him. Just to feel his touch, to hear his voice. He could tell Reg, he thinks, all the terrible thoughts he's had. The weak thoughts. And he'd understand. Just not my mum. Please, not my mum. Anyone but my mum. Regulus doesn't need him to be better. 
be stronger. He doesn't know why that suddenly makes his chest feel too tight. He just wants to be back in their room. Just wants to lie next to him in bed and listen to him talk about gods and mortals and a love that can't be stopped by violence and war and death. James. Potter. James's head snaps up as Frank walks towards them. He falters for a moment, taking in the state of James and seemingly deciding not to comment. He nods his head back towards the castle. It's your turn. Oh, thank Merlin. James scrambles to his feet. He's barely taken five steps before something pulls him back. Serious. His friend is still kneeling in the grass. Coming. He sees it. The surprise. Followed quickly by gratitude. Sirius nods, quickly jogging up to him and causing Frank to arch his brow. It's supposed to be just family? He is family. Frank raises his hands in surrender. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. James doesn't bother responding. Walking so fast he's practically running into the building. She's going to be okay. James only nods. No longer able to muster a response. He feels like his insides are tearing themselves apart. He thinks about the letter he sent this morning. About how inadequate it was. All the things he needs to tell her. Needs her to know. Mr. Potter. McGonagall barely even blinks when he storms into her office, Sirius at his side. Mr. Black. She's sitting at a desk, the fire burning next to her, and he sees. Dad. It's just him. No. No, no, no. He feels Sirius wrap his hand around his arm and squeeze. Dad, wait. James. His mother pushes into view. Sorry, I just went to turn the kettle off. She smiles and he feels his legs almost give out. Thank Merlin for Sirius, who is probably the only reason he doesn't collapse right then and there. <gasps> Mom. They stumble forward, both of them getting on their hands and knees by the fire. You're okay. She looks confused. I am. Of course I am. You said... In your letter, you said you were going to die, Gonelli. And suddenly her eyes grow wide. Oh, darling, no. Not... Not today. James is feeling so many things right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Merlin, that must have been terrible for you. I'm just glad you're okay. I love you. I love you both so much. I'm sorry I don't say that enough. Oh, gosh, James. His dad runs a hand through his hair in a way that is nearly identical to his son. Don't make me cry in front of Minerva, she'll lose all respect for me. Never. Fremont. Serious? You all right, honey? James looks beside himself to find his best friend with wet eyes. Yeah, yeah, I'm just glad you guys are okay. James realises for the first time how scared Sirius has been, and how he buried it so that he could be strong for James. He swears his heart swells so much it nearly breaks his ribs. Oh, well, now you've gone and done it. Fleamont pulls off his glasses to wipe his eyes. Oi, how come he's the one who makes you cry? <laughs> I just like him better than you. <laughs> 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 James feels himself take a proper breath for the first time since he heard Dumbledore's booming voice. Looking at the people he loves, smiling and crying and safe, he thinks, okay, okay, maybe we'll be okay, maybe we'll make it through this. Give it time.